The Ecology of Freedom The Emergence and Dissolution of Hierarchy by Murray Bookchin Preface to the 2005 AK Press edition The Ecology of Freedom has been in print for nearly 30 years to the 2005 AK Press edition. The Ecology of Freedom has been in print for nearly 30 years and read by more than 60,000 fairly demanding people in six different languages. Given its challenging depth and scope, it would be of considerable help in understanding its message for the reader to have an ample knowledge of nature philosophy, social history, radical theory and current political affairs. Not surprisingly, the book has acquired a life and following of its own and is meant to be read on many different levels. I often lay out premises to which I hope the reader will add themes that merit further elaboration under new social circumstances and possibilities. Moreover, the reader is challenged to fill out themes that were only partly developed or hinted at in earlier works. Hence, the reader is invited not only to participate with the author on various levels of analysis, but in a very real sense to engage in an active authorial role, in which he or she continually raises and strives to answer new questions that continue to emerge in periods of rapid social change. Accordingly, the ecology of freedom has never been a final statement of my views. Indeed, such finality never existed in the works of any serious author, because times are always changing, developing, ebbing, and thereby opening radically new ideological pathways. Yesterday's alleged final conflicts actually open new lines of thought that are the opposite of earlier certitudes. Consider only the advances and regressions that were produced by the state, which at one time served the liberatory potentialities of citizenship as distinguished from the animalistic blood tie, but in later times served the oppressive potentialities of kinship and the mindless dictates of biology, in which choice had very little place, if any. The ecology of freedom also draws a sharp line between a simplistic theory of classificatory environmentalism and a sophisticated theory of developmental social ecology, terms that are filled with many diverse meanings. To most readers, the word ecology means little more than what I call environmentalism, that is, the habitat in which human beings other animals, and plants live and interact. By social ecology, I therefore mean ecology as the dialectical unfolding of life forms from the simple to the complex, or more precisely, from the simple to the diverse. This interpretation is arguably problematical. It can be reasonably claimed that diversity in itself does not necessarily yield complexity. But what seems very clear is that without complexity, there cannot be diversity. Thus, a tendency toward diversity is indispensable to the emergence of our rich cosmos of life forms. A cosmos that makes up the multitude of selections in the geological, biotic, and even subjective universe in which we live. This cosmos also makes up the human-made universe, or the second nature, we are imposing on non-human evolution, or first nature. I cannot emphasize too strongly that such a twofold definition of nature is one of the most important distinctions I try to make in this book. Broadly, We must distinguish between a nature 
that is self-created and a nature that is humanly created. Ancient philosophy, particularly the work of Plato and Aristotle, danced around this problem when it tried to define the place of God in the universe as craftsman rather than as a thinker. What should be beyond dispute is that by making humanity the craftsman who fashioned the universe rather than simply declared its existence, rebellious European theologians made human beings into a productive demiurge rather than the source of the mystical word. In short, a second nature was literally created, not simply pronounced. God became the creation of human beings, not simply a mystical creator. Social ecology, in turn, is a philosophy of evolution, not a mystical restatement of St. John's Apocalypse. Humanity, in turn, is both an extension of ecology's insights into social development, from a biological first nature into society's second nature. It tries to transform both non-human and human-made natures into a more complete nature that is conscious, thinking and purposeful. This thinking nature is ethical and rational, not simply physiological and biochemical, and humanity is the most recent attribute among the many that evolution added over at least two billion years of organic development. The word social in social ecology serves the purpose of bringing the highest precepts of libertarian socialism into this concept of an ecological society, that is, a society that embodies the highest goals of thinkers like Aristotle, Spinoza, Hegel, Marx and Kropotkin, to cite the philosophers who had most influenced my thinking. Social ecology, in effect, is a concept of an ever-developing universe, indeed a vast process of achieving wholeness, to the extent that it can ever be fully achieved, by means of unity in diversity, with creative potentialities that thematically intertwine two legacies or traditions, a legacy of freedom and a legacy of domination. These legacies interact to expand independently and interdependently the landscape of freedom and domination. The legacies that educe themes that have been elaborated primarily in the later writings of Marx and Kropotkin has two historical ends. It is thus possible to elaborate an eductive dialectic that can deal with themes like democracy, aesthetics, philosophy, the state, politics, and related so-called superstructural attributes of social and cultural life as integral parts of life and society, not simply as the offspring of economics that, according to Marx, formed the base of social phenomena. A polymorphous theory of history, so to speak, supplants the often narrow monism that prevailed among mechanistic Marxists like Friedrich Engels, George Plekhanov, Lenin et al., trapping Marx himself into the economistic mid-stage of his own cycle of theoretical development. In social ecology, democracy, for example, now becomes an end in itself, unfolding as a basic theme in the legacy of freedom. Similarly, the state can be explored as a basic component of the legacy of domination, often intertwining with the legacy of freedom, as when it secularised the blood tie into the civic tie qua citizen, then later became an instrument of class rule. The two chapters on these legacies 
thus form the book's essential structure and unifying orientation, its double helix, so to speak. Ernst Bloch, in his critical writings, seemed to find a principle of hope in almost every ideology he explored. The times in which I lived, for some eighty years, allowed for no such generosity. Still, I can single out one theme that will terminate either in an ever-expansive development of human freedom, comparable to Marx's ideal of communism, or in an era of ongoing crisis and decline in humanity's relationship with the natural world. This book offers no guarantee of success in the outcome of human development, only the possibility of a rational outcome. In the ecology of freedom, the simplification of biotic evolution would become the harbinger of a world in dissolution. History, conceived as the overall rational continuum of human affairs, would disappear and humanity itself would undergo self-dissolution. The disappearance of the organic would find its expression in the steady decline of complexity, in the replacement of meaning, consciousness, agency, and creative causality by complete purposelessness. This dissembly would constitute a conflict more final than the odious prospects of atomization and social breakdown that confronted humanity in the chronic social crises that marked the previous century. It is this that humanity faces in the coming years if the legacy of domination is permitted to unfold at the expense of the legacy of freedom. If we are to avoid this fate and fulfil instead the legacy of freedom's potentiality, we must transcend the ideological limitations of a mystical proletariat, a battle between undefined class interests and the simplistic aims that bind us to a world long gone. More than ever, we need a clearer vision of humanity's capacity to think as well as to act, to confront reality not only as it is, but as it should be, if we are to survive this, the greatest turning point in history. Much has happened since the Ecology of Freedom was initially published in 1982. In that year, much of the utopistic sensibility of the 1960s was still in the air, and environmental movements were springing up throughout the world. Green political organisations were growing, especially in Western Europe and North America. A principle of hope still held some sway, as the deep reaction of the 1990s had yet to emerge. Yet I cannot emphasise too strongly that the revolutionary optimism that existed between the Russian Revolution of 1917-18 to and the Second World War had been gravely misplaced. Marxism, which regarded the success of revolutionary socialism as an imminent certainty, had totally misjudged the future of radicalism in this interwar period. As the myth of working-class hegemony faded with the end of World War II, as the certainty of a victorious world social revolution gave way to an extraordinary expansion of capital, as capitalism itself prospered, such as it had never done in the past, humanity was not living in the dusk of bourgeois society. Rather, capitalism may well have been emerging from its dawn, or at least was still rooted in an early stage of its development. All the estimates of the left on the decline of bourgeois society were wrong as were the ebullient perspectives that followed in the wake of Red October. We did not know during the interwar period, nor do we know today, in what phase of capitalism we live. What is now clear is that it would be the height of self-deception to call capitalism today a moribund, decaying, 
or dying social system the way we did between 1917 and 1945. Like it or not, capitalism today is robust materially. A fact that the left must finally face with the utmost candor. And we still do not know what forms and features it will have in the years that lie ahead. But what is reasonably clear to me, and I voice this prognosis with the utmost caution, is that bourgeois society cannot continue its devastation of the ecosphere without destroying the biotic and climactic foundations of its own existence. If society as such, if society as such is to survive, it must produce a radically new humanity nature dispensation. That is, we will either create a society that fosters the fecundity of biotic evolution, and that makes life an ever more conscious and creative phenomenon, or produce a world that tears down these ecological elements. This precludes a society that is guided by the maxim of grow or die, the imminent bourgeois drive to reduce the organic to the inorganic in an ever competitive frenzy of capital expansion and human exploitation. Capitalism has made social evolution hopelessly incompatible with ecological evolution. This is the definitive message of the ecology of freedom. There may be no proletarian revolution, no chronic economic crisis, no world wars, or even an inevitable final conflict between classes in the offing. But unless science and techniques can contain the pollution and simplification of the planet, there will decidedly be a crisis in the future that strips the biosphere of its very capacity to support complex life forms. This is one conflict that cannot be placed in doubt, for it blatantly challenges the existence of our species. All the problems explored by the ecology of freedom converge in the need to create an ecological society based on a new and organic politics called libertarian municipalism, a subject I explored in some detail in my later book, From Urbanization to Cities. Twenty years later, seeking a balanced viewpoint. Introduction to the 1991 edition. Some twenty years ago, I began writing The Ecology of Freedom with a very clear purpose in mind, to advance a holistic, socially radical and theoretically coherent alternative to the largely technocratic, reformist and single-issue environmental movements that were holding centre stage at that time. Thanks to a contract I received from Alfred A. Knopf in 1970 and a modest Rabinovitz Foundation grant, I was able to complete the four opening chapters of this book in 1972. Apart from a few modifications, those chapters remain unaltered from what they were nearly 20 years ago. After various interruptions, I returned to the manuscript as the 70s drew to a close and completed it for publication. In the meantime, the retirement of my original editor at Knopf foreclosed the likelihood that it would be published by that firm, and without ado, I turned the manuscript over to a very sympathetic firm, Cheshire Books, which published it in 1982. I cannot emphasise too strongly that the ecology of freedom reflects my preoccupation with the rather narrow, pragmatic, often socially neutral environmentalism that held sway two decades ago in the collection of disparate groups. Such environmentalism still in fact enjoys preeminence today. These groups continue to focus on specific issues like air and water, pollution, toxic waste dumps, 
the chemicalization of food and so forth, endeavors to be sure that I feel deserve our fullest support. But the views of environmentalists on the causes of and long range solutions to the problems they face seemed and still seem to me to be woefully inadequate. Insofar as environmentalists shared a common outlook, it rested on an instrumental, almost engineering approach to solving ecological dislocations. To all appearances, they wanted to adapt the natural world to the needs of the existing society and its exploitative, capitalistic imperatives by way of reforms that minimize harm to human health and well being. The much needed goals of formulating a project for radical social change and for cultivating a new sensibility toward the natural world tended to fall outside the orbit of their practical concerns. Lobbying, rather than radical politics, seem to embody their social views. After having been active for decades as an eco-anarchist in fighting pollution, the construction of nuclear power plants, and the chemicalization of food, I decided to write a far-reaching presentation of my views, partly critical and partly reconstructive. In contrast to pragmatic environmentalism, I advanced a comprehensive body of ideas that I call social ecology. For social ecologists, our environmental dislocations are deeply rooted in an irrational, anti-ecological society, a society whose basic problems are irremediable by piecemeal, single-issue reforms. I try to point out that these problems originate in a hierarchical, class, and today competitive capitalist system that nourishes a view of the natural world as a mere agglomeration of resources for human production and consumption. This social system is especially rapacious. It has projected the domination of human by human into an ideology that so-called man is destined to dominate so-called nature. Accordingly, looking back in time to the preliterate organic society that existed before hierarchy and capitalism emerged, I explored the non-hierarchical sensibilities, practices, values and beliefs of egalitarian cultures generally, as well as the social features of organic society that seemed to be relevant to the development of a radical ecological politics today, the principle of the irreducible minimum, by which organic society is guaranteed to everyone the material means of life, its commitment to usufruct rather than the ownership of property, its ethics of complementarity, as distinguished from a morality of command and obedience. All of these principles and values, to my mind, were and are desiderata that should find a major place in a future ecological society. It also felt that they had to be integrated with the rationality, science and in large part the techniques of the modern world, redesigned to be sure, to promote humanity's integration with the non-human world. This selective integration should form the overarching practices of an entirely new society and sensibility. At the same time, I examined organic society's various religious beliefs and cosmologies, its naturalistic rituals, its mythic personalizations of animals and animal spirits, its embodiment of fertility in a mother goddess, and its overall animistic outlook. I believed that the Enlightenment's battle against superstition had been long since won in American and European culture, and that no one would mistake me for advocating a revival of animism or goddess worship. As much as I admired many features of organic cultures, I never believed that we could or should introduce their naive, religious, mythic 
or magical beliefs, or their cosmologies into the present-day ecology movement. Even in the late 70s, I had unnerving suspicions that one could write on ecology and its spiritual implications, as I did, and easily be mistaken for a spiritualist, and similarly, even write on sophisticated, organismic forms of thought like dialectics and be misread as a mystic. But little did I realise that even as I was writing The Ecology of Freedom, new ecologies were in fact emerging, principally in the American Sun Belt, that would seek to do exactly what I had tried to avoid. These ecologies began to recycle many beliefs that superficially resemble the kind of ideas I had advanced into a New Age Romanticism and produce a mystical ecology that was all but a collection of assorted atavistic religious cults. They now appear under such names as Deep Ecology, Earth Goddess Worship and Ecological Animism, all of which can be generically called Mystical Ecology and they use various New Age ideals, magical rituals, and a wide assortment of religious or quasi-religious practices. Many atavists among these mystical ecologists call for a return to a Neolithic or even Pleistocene so-called sensibility, and in extreme cases, literally to prehistoric ways of life. Nearly all of them share a common outlook called biocentricity, which equates all life forms, including bacteria and viruses, with one another in terms of their intrinsic worth, so-called. Biocentrism is defined in contrast to anthropocentrism, the largely religious view, as their repeated references to scriptural texts suggest that the earth was created for human use. Also permeating many mystical ecologies is a preference for wilderness, so-called, as distinguished from humanly altered areas of the planet, and all too often an unfeeling Malthusianism that views famine and disease as Gaia's retribution for human intervention into nature as well as for human overpopulation. Ecofeminism, too, has been transformed from an appreciation of women's historical role in bearing and rearing children into a veneration of women as closer to nature than men. Added to this imagery is a belief in an earth goddess whose worship is expected to transform patriarchal views of women into a theistic eternal feminine. In short, I began to see a growing array of mystical, romantic and often downright silly ecologies emerge that now threaten the very integrity of a rational ecology movement. I regard these mystical ecologies as utterly fatuous as they are simply naive, even when many of them disassociate themselves from the same pragmatic environmentalism of the 1970s that this book criticises. Today, attempts to balance reason and technology with organic thinking and spirituality have been virtually subverted by the emergence of mystical, quasi-religious images of non-human nature. Indeed, The time when one could use the word nature rather broadly without connoting the crude pantheism of a universal oneness or a strident fetishization of wilderness has virtually disappeared. The mischief wrought particularly by deep ecology, by the misanthropic anti-humanism that extends even to a hatred of the Renaissance, by the unfeeling Malthusianism and by often self-contradictory notions structured around biocentrism, all have now made ecological politics and philosophy into a highly problematic arena.
This introduction is meant to untangle and disassociate social ecology from these various mystical ecologies, and at the same time retain a critical attitude toward pragmatic environmentalism. More emphatically, I wish to correct any affinity the reader may find between social ecology and the various mystical ecologies that are flourishing today. Despite these new circumstances, which social ecology must confront, I strongly adhere to the ideas the ecology of freedom advances, nor do I feel any need to modify them, apart from explaining certain metaphors that the mystical ecologists have used in conjunction with social ecologists, albeit for very different purposes. What I wish to do in this introduction is to strike a more balanced view of the ideas, interpretations and data contained in this book. The ecology of freedom still remains the most comprehensive statement of my ideas and of social ecology generally, and I do not wish to diminish its position in my writings. My work's theoretical arch, if I may call it such, is reared by some nine books, among which the ecology of freedom may be regarded as the keystone. But I would ask readers of this book to consult some of the other works as well that round out a social ecological perspective, notably From Urbanization to Cities, Remaking Society, and The Philosophy of Social Ecology. Taken together, these works provide a comprehensive statement of social ecology as it exists today, and form a basis for its development in the future. Lastly, some degree of repetition in preparing this new retrospective introduction is unavoidable. I do not attempt the broad overview of social ecology that appears in the original introduction, a reading of which I regard as indispensable to an understanding of this book. But there are issues that I take up here, like Marxism and ecology, that provide the reader with more detailed explanations of my views. This does not diminish the need to read both introductions. The original, a more elucidatory presentation, and the Black Rose introduction, a more polemical one. All of my writings are meant to give a coherent view of the social sources of our ecological crisis and to offer an eco-anarchist project to restructure society along rational lines. I use the words coherent and rational provocatively here, for these terms are anathema to most of the emerging mystical ecologies. Moreover, they are used to challenge a much broader state of mind that has become integrally part of the human condition in the Anglo-American world generally, and in many parts of Europe today. Postmodernism, in particular its most vulgar forms, has had a disquieting effect on the need for a coherent and rational body of radical political ideas. With deconstruction, the claims of reason itself are being dismembered in the name of a passion for pluralism, a passion that is understandable in the face of modern totalitarianism, but that cannot be justified when it calls any thought-out body of views logocentric. In this extremely debased form, postmodernism prefixes logocentric with adjectives like white, male, western and European, foreclosing all further discussion. I hesitate to predict what new fads are surfacing on college campuses and in the media, even as this introduction is being written. We are faced with the difficulty that few people seem to know how to build or develop ideas anymore. They promiscuously collect intellectual fragments here and there, like so many dismembered artefacts 
drawing upon basically contradictory views and traditions with complete aplomb. Indeed, any serious attempt to rationally discuss the very troubling issues of our time in a coherent manner is often treated as a symptom of psychopathology rather than an earnest effort to make sense of the ideological chaos so prevalent today. Ironically, in its own quixotic way, postmodernism often inadvertently works with a rationality of its own that is nonetheless opaque to itself, and it often strives for the very coherence whose existence it denies to its critics. The intellectual tendencies that celebrate incoherence, anti-rationalism and mysticism are not merely symptoms of a waning intellectuality today. They literally justify and foster it. The massive shift by many people away from serious concerns with the objective conditions of life, such as institutional forms of domination, the use of technology for exploitative purposes, and the everyday realities of human suffering toward an introverted subjectivism, with its overwhelming focus on psychology and hidden motivations, the rise of the culture industry, and the intellectual anxieties over collegiate issues like academic careers and pedagogical eminence, all testify to a sense of disempowerment in both social and personal life. That the mystical ecologies are becoming popular today is not a mere intellectual aberration any more than the popularity of postmodernism. To the contrary, their popularity expresses the inability of millions of people to cope with a harsh and demoralizing reality, to control the increasingly oppressive direction in which society is moving. Hence, myths, pagan deities, and Pleistocene and Neolithic belief systems, together with their priests and priestesses, provide a surrogate reality into which the naive acolyte can escape. Indeed, when this preening emphasis on the subjective is clothed in the mystical vapours and incohate vagaries of fevered imaginations, any recognition of reality is dissolved by beliefs in the mythic. The rational is replaced by the intuitional, and palpable social opponents are replaced by their shadows to be exercised by rituals, incantations, and magical gymnastics. All of these practices are merely socially harmless surrogates for dealing with the authentic problems of our time. Ghosts from a different past, the products of our ancestors' own imaginations, in turn, are invoked as objects of our reverence in the name of an earth wisdom that is actually as ineffectual as we are in our everyday lives. The new surrogate reality, so-called, that is becoming a widespread feature in our time, percolates through the mass media and the publishing industry, which are only too eager to nourish, even celebrate, the proliferation of Wiccan covens, goddess-worshipping congregations, assorted pantheistic and animistic cults, wilderness devotees, and eco-feminist acolytes, to which I can add a new deep ecology professoriate that is increasingly prepared to feed a gullible public with biocentric pablum. Perhaps the most compelling real fact that radicals in our era have not adequately faced is the fact that capitalism today has become a society, not only an economy. The rivalries, the grow-or-die mentality, and the chaos of the marketplace have percolated from the realms of commerce and industry, which were once largely confined to economic life, into the daily life of familial, personal, sexual, religious, and community relationships. This invasion 
is reflected by the often unadorned egotism, consumerism, careerism, mutual suspicion, and highly transitory forms of human intercourse, so widespread today. In the decades that followed the end of the Second World War, we have seen a development that has not only produced the anomie of the lonely crowd, it has now taken the form of a totally commodified world in which people resemble the very commodities that they produce and consume. Fragmentation has ceased to be a mere malaise and become an ideology, one that conforms with, rather than critiques, the prevailing human condition in the form of a vulgar postmodernism. Present day anti rational ideologies express rather than reject the unthinking and self seeking life world so frenziedly peopled by the inhabitants of the stock market floors of the world. These ideologies, from postmodernism to eco feminism, serve to subtly enchant the new human commodities with the mental fireworks, amulets, charms, and brightly tinted garments that provide them with a mystical patina to conceal their empty lives. Capitalism has nothing whatever to fear from mystical and biocentric ecologies, or their many high-priced artifacts. The bourgeoisie easily guffaws at these absurdities, and is only too eager to commodify them into new sources of profit. Indeed, to state the issue bluntly, it is profit, power, and economic expansion that primarily concerns the elites of the existing social order, not the antics or even the protests of dissenters, who duel with the ghosts instead of institutionalized centers of power authority, and wealth. My purpose in developing social ecology over the past decades has been a frankly ambitious one, to present a philosophy, a conception of natural and social development, an in-depth analysis of our social and environmental problems, and a radical utopian alternative. To this day, I do not eschew the use of the word utopian to the present social and environmental crisis. It may be helpful here to single out some issues that should be added to the overview I present in the original introduction. I shall begin by asking, what is humanity's place in natural evolution? This question is not simply an environmental one, it has far-reaching social and philosophical implications. Human beings and human society, in varying respects, are products of a natural evolution. Further, human beings are organized anatomically and physiologically by natural evolution to interact with non-human nature productively, as creatures that consciously produce their own means of life with tools, machines, and the organized deployment of their very capacity to labor. As Hegel and radical social theorists of the last century emphasized, humanity's interaction or metabolism with non-human nature not only provides human beings with the means of life, it defines them as, one would hope, increasingly conscious and psychologically complex beings. Humanity's emergence from and continuing daily interaction with non-human nature is not only the means by which they maintain themselves materially, it is also one of the major ways they become aware of themselves as individuals and as very unique species. Call them Homo sapiens, Homo faber, Homo economicus, or what you will. Their very humanness and the kinds of societies they create stem in large measure from their efforts to rework 
non-human nature into a habitat where they can live the good life and hopefully contribute fruitfully to the enhancement of natural evolution. Hence, the question of what place human beings occupy in natural evolution raises some of the most fundamental social issues that radical social theorists confront. The ways in which human labour is used, the role of techniques in altering the environment as well as in altering the human spirit, the forms of social relations that human beings develop in dealing with non-human nature, and, of paramount importance, the ethics they formulate by which they are guided in interacting with the surrounding world. I shall be careful in this introduction to avoid using the word nature without adding an adjective to qualify it. In fact, the greatest confusion has arisen as a result of the many and often contradictory meanings imputed to the word throughout the course of Western history and philosophy. I was no less remiss in this regard than others when the ecology of freedom was completed a decade ago. In their inventory of some meanings of nature, Arthur O. Lovejoy and George Boas list 66 definitions, ranging from birth to matter, and we are then told that their list is doubtless incomplete. I am no devotee of one-line propositional definitions, but the multiplicity of ways in which the word nature has been defined woefully obscures the word's meaning. Judgments about what is natural and what is not natural, indeed about what constitutes the rights of man, are a major source of ethical confusion today. This is particularly the case with supporters of deep ecology, for whom nature usually carries the very narrow and particular connotations of wilderness, a term that is itself direly in need of explication at a time when human activities have reached directly or indirectly into the most remote areas of the planet so that their impact brings the very notion of wilderness into question. Lest our thinking be frozen by too narrow a notion of nature, as primeval wilderness, that a presumably unnatural humanity, yet another term that needs clarification, invades and destroys, we must decide what so vague and emotionally highly charged a term means. For in a broad sense, everything is natural, insofar as it exists, certainly on the subatomic level be it a plastic table or wolves on the Alaskan tundra. Nature, defined in this purely materialist sense, may be more all-embracing and in its own way more accurate than the narrow or metaphorical uses of the term. But from an ecological viewpoint, so sweeping a definition is simply vacuous and lacks that all-important ethical attribute we call meaning. Viewed from a social and ecological standpoint, nature, to social ecologists at least, is not simply everything that exists. It is an evolutionary development, as I emphasize in the body of this book, that should be conceived as an eons-long process of ever greater differentiation from the primal energy pulse that supposedly gave rise to the Big Bang, to the emergence of subatomic particles and the forces that bind the universe, to the complex elements that are known to us in the periodic table, to the appearance of all the celestial bodies of which we have knowledge, to the combination of elements into molecules, amino acids, proteins, and so forth, up to or until the emergence of organic and sentient beings on our planet. Nature, in short, is the cumulative evolutionary process 
from the inanimate to the animate, and ultimately the social, however differentiated this process may be. Following a tradition that may date back to the beginnings of Western philosophy, non-human nature can be designated first nature. In juxtaposition to the social nature created by human beings, called second nature. Social ecology is almost alone these days in dealing with these two developments of nature as a whole, as a highly creative and shared evolution, rather than as an oppositional and purely dualistic antinomy. By contrast, mystical ecologies, with their biocentric notions, often disdain the problems of humanity and second nature. Indeed, they tend to venerate first nature as wilderness. These ecologies often view the human species as an evolutionary aberration, or worse, as an absolute disaster, a cancer on the biosphere. What we encounter among mystical ecologies is a crude reductionism that ignores the rich differentiations that biotic evolution has produced and sees instead a universal oneness and interconnectedness that visualizes a whole without meaningful differentiations. To this reductionism, social ecology opposes a view of an evolutionary dialectic of development and emergence, of variety and differentiation, indeed, the phasing of first into second nature as a shared and meaningful process. The word nature is deliberately preserved in the concepts of a first and second nature to emphasize that both non-human and human nature are the product of a natural evolution as a whole not of a supernature, be it imminent as many mystical-oriented ecologies would have us believe, or a vague presence in our midst. Even the most ostensibly secular of deep ecology writers tend to exhibit a certain amount of religiosity. By definition, in fact, even the most political acolytes of goddess worship are implicitly non-naturalistic, if not explicitly supernaturalistic. The promiscuous use of the word sacred to denote natural phenomena in mystical ecologies expresses a belief in the holiness of the non-human world rather than a sense of wonder. Hence the ease with which these ecologies lend themselves to the sacerdotal and a belief in the divine. Social ecology, by contrast, contends that if the word ecology is used to describe our outlook, it is preposterous to invoke deities, mystical forces to account for the evolution of first nature into second nature. Neither religion nor a spiritualistic vision of experience has any place in an ecological lexicon. Either the term ecology applies to natural phenomena by definition, or it is a chic metaphor for the disempowered consciousness that fosters mysticism or outright supernaturalism. Social ecologists use the word social, in turn, in a way that is free of the slipshod, often metaphorical confusion that leads to an identification of animal groups, herds, and eco-communities with society. It is basic to social ecology that whereas animals form communities, they do not form societies. Society is the exclusive province of humans, for what distinguishes a human society from an animal community is the existence of of social institutions. In this respect, social ecologies 
anarchistic outlook should be distinguished from that of Peter Kropotkin, who not only used the phrase animal societies interchangeably with animal communities, but believed that they stemmed from a social instinct. Perhaps, but as we shall see, this instinct was by no means social in the human sense, nor does it accord with what we know about the malleability of human society. Community, in short, may be invoked as a necessary condition for sociality of one kind or another, but it is certainly not a sufficient condition for explaining the existence of society. And indeed, human societies stand in very marked contrast to animal communities. In the first place, animal communities are relatively fixed. Some of the most so-called social of animals, such as the bee, behave overwhelmingly in a response to the way they are genetically programmed, so-called. And their hives are simply large reproductive communities. By contrast, human societies are structured around highly mutable institutions, be they tribal, slave, feudal, or capitalist in form. Societies have to be defended and preserved with a sense of deliberate purpose. Indeed, where animal communities exist with any degree of permanence, their members exhibit little, if any, conscious intentionality. Human societies, by contrast, are not only highly institutionalized and changeable, but they are clothed in ideologies that may be altered radically depending upon material and cultural conditions, as the histories of all the great revolutions of the past so dramatically reveal. Social ecology's use of the terms first and second nature gains particular importance when we examine the specifics of the transition from first to second nature. In tracing the natural transitions from first to second nature, or from non-human communities to human society, I have been more disposed to adopt Robert Briffaut's thesis of prolonged human infantile dependency and maturation, a development that focuses on primate maternal association, than Kropotkin's proto-sociobiological arguments for a genetically imprinted social instinct, which is actually absent in many advanced animal species like leopards, and even in primates like the orangutan. Moreover, hierarchy, a strictly social term, is exclusively characteristic of second nature. It refers to institutionalized and highly ideological systems of command and obedience. Etymologically, the word derives from the ancient Greek term meaning priestly forms of organization. The utmost havoc has been created by anthropomorphically applying the word hierarchy to various entities in non-human nature. As a social term, hierarchy cannot be applied to so-called dominance and submission relationships among animals where these truly exist at all. Many allegedly hierarchical animal relationships are actually very arbitrary and limited, as I emphasize in the book. They markedly differ in function from one group of individuals to another within the same species. More important, to apply the term to animal communities divests hierarchy of its strictly social character. Still further havoc has been created by applying the word hierarchy 
to humanity's relationship with first nature as a whole. Notably, by alleging that humanity dominates first nature, or indeed, to explain the interrelationships among mineral, geophysical, and inorganic phenomena generally. Such anthropomorphic projections of specifically intrahuman phenomena are utterly unwarranted. Alas, my repeated objections to the extension of anthropomorphic images from the social world to the non-human in this respect has been of little avail. Indeed, I have recently been accused of hierarchical thinking simply for noting that humanity has been endowed by natural evolution with a degree of intellectuality, a range of expression, a physical flexibility and a cultural tradition that is unprecedented in the biotic world. My claim that human beings have the potentiality to bring their consciousness to the service of natural evolution in an ecological society has been regarded by deep ecologists as self-serving, if not arrogant. Social ecologists, let me note, were among the first to elaborate the concept of hierarchy as a part of radical social theory in the 1960s, and it has since become a cliché that underpins, for example, radical feminist views of female oppression as a trans-class phenomenon. That people whose ways of thinking are patently anthropomorphic, such as goddess worshippers, and whose ways of interpreting the non-human world are stridently genderized, now level charges of anthropocentricity against social ecology is a curious and intellectually ungracious phenomenon indeed. To say that human beings are more advanced than other life forms simply connotes the fact that they are more complex, more differentiated, or more fully endowed with certain valuable attributes than others. Let me emphasize that this fact does not in itself mean that humans establish hierarchical relationships with non-human nature. Although we may be a highly complex and subjective group of organisms, we are actually more dependent on the phytoplankton in the seas, very simple organisms, that provide us with much of our atmospheric oxygen than we are dependent on us. Yet no social ecologist would argue that simply by virtue of our complexity and subjectivity, we somehow command those indispensable, if simple, oxygen-producing life forms. I take this question up in more detail later in this introduction. Suffice it to say here that the mere existence of differences, including differences of greater or lesser complexity, does not presuppose or imply hierarchy, least of all in relationships between human beings and other life forms. As for the cultural evolution of second nature, the opening chapter of The Ecology of Freedom draws a sharp distinction between egalitarian organic societies and hierarchical societies. A plausible case can be made for viewing the earliest human communities as egalitarian, in which differentiations along age, gender and kinship lines were functionally complementary to each, not based on command and obedience. Organic society is notable for its non-hierarchical outlook toward experience, a sensibility that accepts differences in people, such as those of age and gender, on their own terms, without ranking them in hierarchical status groups. Organic societies usually cast their institutional arrangements along complementary lines, in which differences among individuals 
form a pattern of relationship rather than a system of dominance and submission. Such communities are mutualistic or complementary in that they take responsibility for the well-being of all their members, irrespective of their capabilities. Their members respect each other without exercising judgments to cast people in superordinate and subordinate roles. By contrast, hierarchical societies are distinctly status-oriented in ways with which we are only too familiar at present. Far too many organic cultures slowly began to organize these differentiations along hierarchical lines. After members of organic societies coalesced into status groups that were often based as much on service as on privilege, their age, gender and familial ties were soon institutionalized into gerontocracies patriarchies, and military fraternities. In time, these hierarchical arrangements led to the emergence of social and economic elites, and still later, to economic classes and state bureaucracies. The unity that once marked the emergence of second nature gave way to clashes of interest that sharply pitted human against human, ending the primal but innocent unity of early egalitarian groups. Hierarchy emerged primarily as an imminent development within society that slowly phased humanity from fairly egalitarian relationships into a society institutionalized around command and obedience. The chapter, The Emergence of Hierarchy, traces a logical and anthropologically verified development toward a complex hierarchical society, from gerontocracy through patricentricity, shamanistic guilds, warrior groups, chiefdoms, and finally to state-like formations, even before classes began to emerge. All of these hierarchical strata interacted in highly complex ways, reworking the biological facts of life, like age and gender, into distinctly institutional forms. Status innovations were permeated by certain honoured traditions that had shaped organic society, in order to render hierarchy more socially acceptable to dominated people, and eventually to ingrain them as inevitable in the popular mind. Hierarchy, clearly, has taken many forms that nonetheless share a common feature. They are organised systems of command and obedience. Despite their multiplicity of forms, it is crucial for students of society to fully understand these forms and to eliminate hierarchy per se not simply replace one form of hierarchy with another. The dialectical unfolding of hierarchy has left in its wake an ages-long detritus of systems of domination involving ethnic, gendered, age, vocational, urban, rural, and many other forms of dominating people. Indeed, an elaborate system of rule that economistic class analyses and strictly anti-statist approaches do not clearly reveal. If human freedom is to be definitively achieved, this detritus must be exposed and understood in all its complexity and interactions. It will do us little good to contend that all the evils in the world stem from a monolithic patriarchy, for example or that hierarchy will wither away once women or putative female values replace male supremacy and its male values. Indeed, hierarchical domination would scarcely be dented if the revolutionary call of one leading feminist, Susan Brownmiller, were heeded. 
I am not someone who employs the word revolutionary lightly, Brown Miller has written. But women's total integration into the police forces, and by total I mean 50-50, not less, is a revolutionary goal of the highest importance for the rights of women. Unquote. One can only pause with astonishment at such a naive and breathtakingly regressive demand. There is no reason to believe that a gender-integrated police force, or for that matter, a gender-integrated army, state bureaucracy, or corporate board of directors, given the very nature of these institutions as inherently hierarchical, would lead to a rational and ecological society. Nor do we gain an understanding of the emergence of patriarchy, more properly, patricentricity, a social orientation that privileges males, to contend, as do many ecofeminists, that hierarchy emerged when a caring, loving, tender, matricentric village world in the early Neolithic was suddenly swept away by a cavalry invasion of Indo-European patriarchal warriors that invasions played a role in transforming organic into hierarchical society is a fact I would be the last to deny. But to use invasions almost exclusively to explain this development, as certain eco-feminists do, raises the question of why the invaders themselves were hierarchical. Nor can the emergence of patricentricity be explained by an invasion that presumably occurred in one part of the world, while it developed in many remote cultures that could never have had any significant interaction with one another. So simplistic an explanation beggars credulity and does violence not only to the ways in which cultures affect one another, but runs counter to the historical facts as we know them today. Here, Janet Beale's examination of ecofeminists' exaggerated accounts of Indo-European or Kurgan invasions greatly illuminate these issues. The complex dialectic of hierarchy in the ecology of freedom challenges not only the simplifications introduced by mystical and ecofeminist ecologies into the problems of domination, but also brings into question the one-sided economistic simplifications that are rooted in traditional Marxian class analyses. I do not wish to diminish the importance of class rule in explaining present-day ecological problems. But class rule must be placed in the much larger context of hierarchy and domination as a whole. If the so-called materialist conception of history has made any headway in the environmental movement, it is largely due to the fact that certain Marxists today hold a very elastic notion of Marx's own writings. Marx himself defined class in two distinct senses. The first was essentially negative. Quote, Insofar as millions of families live under economic conditions that separate their mode of life, their interests and their culture from those of other classes, and puts them in harsh opposition to the latter. Unquote. What makes this definition a negative one is that it crudely presupposes what it is meant to explain. In the German ideology, however, Marx and Engels defined class in a more positive or substantive sense. Here, class is seen as originating as a result of a growing division of labour, leading to the patriarchal family, slave society, feudalism, and of course, capitalism. 
it is crucially defined in terms of the ownership of property, be that property women, children, slaves, serfs, capital, or the labour power of the proletariat that the bourgeoisie buys on the labour market. Class is thus essentially tied to property, even when property is owned or managed corporately, be it by an elite of free citizens in the ancient world, by feudal lords in the medieval world, or by stockholders in the modern world. Basically, a class nexus is formed by who owns or controls what and whose labour is being exploited economically. If classes can be said to be structured around the ownership and control of property, hierarchies constitute much subtler and more elusive phenomena based not only on biological facts like age, gender and kinship differences, for example, but also on social facts like ethnocentricity, bureaucratic control and national origin. These so-called facts are not marked strictly by economic or by exploitative functions. Indeed, the attainment of status and prestige may even involve giving one's property away to the point of sheer destitution, as in the potlatch ceremonies of the Northwest Indians. Marx elaborated a wealth of social and economic ideas over his huge corpus of writings, but the economistic basis of his social view has proven to be rather simplistic. Nor can the economistic basis of his definition of class be sloughed off by adorning it with all kinds of cultural traits. The subtleties of Marx's notion of alienation and reification so inspirational to the modern-day neo-Marxist theorists, can never be separated from his overwhelming preoccupation with the labour process and with the commodity as a good produced for exchange, or, more fundamentally, his view of the proletariat's hegemonic role in changing society, a notion that has patently come to grief in our own time but the economistic basis of class, especially the control and use of surplus labour, is particularly important in terms of the sweeping historical drama that Marx inherited from the Enlightenment. For it rests squarely on the Marxian notion that first nature is above all a, quote, realm of necessity, unquote, of inevitable scarce raw materials that must be painfully extracted, reworked and finished into useful things by human labour. Traced back to the biblical myth of original sin, this drama casts first nature in the role of a stingy, intractable and ungiving domain, one that labour must in some sense tame, or at least endure as a form of punishment for the malfeasance of Adam and Eve. 19th century economics added a fatalistic touch of its own to this theological drama by literally defining itself as the study of scarce resources versus unlimited needs. Hence, the contemporary reputation of economics as the dismal science. Marxism radically secularised this myth and extended it to encompass the whole tableau of human history. Once classes arose, according to Marx, they acquired their raison d'etre because the ultimate historical goal of providing the good life for humanity required the domination of first nature. The domination of first nature, in turn, required the mobilisation of of labour by a privileged, indeed supervisory, 
class of rulers and exploiters. The exploitation of human beings in the process of production, indeed the use of human bodies as machines, was thus, for Marx, the earliest technical step toward bringing first nature into the service of humanity, whose liberation was to be definitively completed with the achievement of communism. Laudable as Marx's ultimate goal may have been, no more plausible apologia for the existence of class or state rule has ever appeared over the course of history, and few have provided better excuses for domination than this one. For what made Marx's version of this dismal drama unique was that he turned it into a heroic epic. Once nature was mastered, dominated and freely opened to exploitation, there would be no reason for the continued existence of classes and states. As a result of a proletarian revolution, humanity would come into its own as the fulfilment of all its caring intellectual and artistic potentialities. I do not propose to dwell on all the aspects of this simplistic drama. Social ecology's drama is fundamentally different from those of biblical precept and Marxian socialism. First, nature is neither stingy nor intractable. Rather, convinced as a developmental process, as distinguished from the static, picture postcard scenic view of wilderness that often passes for nature in deep ecology, it is extraordinarily fecund marked by an increasing wealth of differentiation, neural complexity, and the formation of diverse ecological niches. To be sure, the planet does contain some places that are unusually inhospitable for life, but first nature can be regarded as a harsh realm of necessity, mainly in terms of the senseless needs it is expected to satisfy. Should these needs become extravagant or utterly irrational, first nature's fecundity might seem to shrink relative to the needs with which it is burdened. This would clearly be the case if one's interpretation of the economy of nature were saddled with the concept of insatiable wants that always confront limited resources, a concept that is regrettably implicit in Marx's discussion of needs in Volume 3 of Capital. Certainly, among human beings, needs are so highly conditioned by society that they must be dealt with as social issues, not simply as matters of geophysics or population numbers. Suffice it to say here that evolution is an ever-differentiating process in which increasingly complex organisms emerge from relatively simple ones. A process in which life, generally speaking, becomes ever more complex, ever more neurally flexible, and increasingly differentiated despite the tendency of many species to become overly specialised and captive to limited ecological niches. The view of first nature as intractable or stingy thus stands at odds with social ecology's emphasis on the variety and multitude of life forms we encounter in the fossil record and in the world around us. That living things eat or are eaten, that they suffer pain through accidents as prey or in struggles for survival all of which exposes them to selective processes that determine whether they will continue to live or disappear, is not a debatable issue in social ecology's view of first nature. Following very much in the tradition of Peter Kropotkin's mutual aid, however, social ecology also emphasises that the survival of living beings greatly depends on their ability to be supportive 
of one another. This mutual aid, to use Kropotkin's words, and particularly the process of differentiation and the variety of habits that evolution creates, opens new avenues of biotic development for existing or emerging species. Depending upon the extent to which life forms develop neurologically, they are capable of making rudimentary choices in adapting to new environments or in actually creating new niches for themselves. Increasing subjectivity turns organisms into an active force in their own evolution, not merely the passive objects of natural selection. Their survival and development now begins to depend upon the rudimentary judgments they make in interacting with and altering their own environments. They begin to make choices, indeed at times fairly complex ones, and exhibit a dim form of intentionality that we can properly associate with rudimentary forms of freedom. Looking back over time, it is fair to say that natural evolution is not the narrow, restrictive realm of necessity that Marx designated as nature, but rather a highly fecund development that exhibits a striving toward consciousness and freedom, however dim these qualities may seem in even highly complex non-human organisms. I am not making the contention that there are predetermined ends or a telos in natural evolution that guides life's development inexorably toward consciousness and freedom. But I would insist that the potentiality for achieving consciousness and freedom does exist. The reader is welcome to regard this development as a mere tendency, as a reasonable likelihood, or simply as a blunt fact supported by the fossil record, not a supposed law of nature. In any case, a rich tradition exists in Western philosophy that describes a subtle grading of life from fairly simple life forms to the emergence of complex sentient beings, beings that also change their environments to meet their own survival needs. From the minimal notion of organic self-maintenance, I believe that we can plausibly argue that a nisus exists that leads from passive reaction to active interaction, from intentionality to choice, and finally to conceptual thought and foresight. I call this approach to evolution dialectical naturalism, in order to distinguish its processual dialectic from the fairly mechanistic laws of dialectical materialism advanced by writers like Friedrich Engels and from the dialectical idealism of Fichte and Hegel. Finally, natural evolution has indeed produced beings, human beings, who can act rationally in the world, guided far less by instinct than by rich intellectuality rooted in conceptual thought and complex forms of symbolic communication. These beings are of the biotic world as organisms, mammals and primates, yet they are also apart from it as creatures that produce the vast array of cultural artefacts and associations that we call second nature. Second nature consists, largely, of the tools that the earliest humans developed over a span of a half million years or more. The habitats they willfully created for their security and well-being, and the organised social life that they institutionalised as families, then bands, tribes, hierarchies, classes and the state. And finally, such cultural achievements as philosophy, science, 
techniques, and art. This cultural development is uniquely human. Not only are human societies composed of definable but mutable institutions that have changed radically over the course of social history, they include equally definable but mutable ideologies that rationalize the existence of various institutions, a richly elaborate culture that finds its expression in a wide ranging symbolic language, and a written historical record, all of which have no precedent. In the non human world. Even more unprecedented is the extent to which second nature changes first nature. Sweeping changes of immense significance were often produced, moreover, by Aboriginal peoples, albeit on a scale that was greatly exceeded by so called industrialized ones. I shall examine. Changes made by Aboriginal societies at a later point in this introduction. What is important to note for the present is that second nature can be distinguished from first nature, not because human beings are less animalistic than non human beings, but quite to the contrary, because it is part of their very animality to seek these changes, as would any living thing. If it could. People change first nature by virtue of their naturally endowed capacities to think conceptually, to create extra biological tools and machines, and to do this with a high degree of collective organization and intentionality that is profoundly different from the behaviors and abilities of non human beings. Not only are these unprecedented human survival capacities a product of natural evolution, they open a still newer realm of potentiality the potentiality to evolve along social lines and produce a second nature that profoundly affects the evolution and life forms of first nature. Once human society finally emerges, As a distinct worldwide phenomenon, it becomes meaningless to speak of ecological issues in strictly biological terms. Indeed, like it or not, nearly every ecological issue is also a social issue. In fact, as we shall see, nearly all our present day ecological dislocations have their basic sources in social dislocations. Hence, my conviction that a serious environmental movement today must be based on social ecology if it is to be intellectually consistent, insightful, and environmentally relevant. I say this provocatively at a time when a huge literature has surfaced that tries to refocus public attention away from social issues. And towards socially neutral phenomena like technology as such, rather than the social matrix of techniques, toward science as such, rather than the social abuses of science, and toward reason as such, rather than the reduction of reason largely to a means ends skill to be used for instrumental ends. Permeating these rather simplistic efforts to direct public attention away from the social underpinnings of our ecological problems is that same ubiquitous mysticism and theism that, in an era of social disempowerment, foster a proclivity for supernatural escape. Among ecological radicals, confrontation with the stark problems of the warming of the planet. The thinning of the ozone layer and other effects of growth produced by capital accumulation is slowly giving away to atavistic celebrations of a mythic, neolithic, and Pleistocene. As this rubbish sediments itself into the ecology movement, even confrontation itself is denounced as divisive and disruptive. Yet rarely 
have the very real divisions and disruptions in second nature been more in need of being confronted than they are today, when the very survival of our biosphere is in question? Nor can we ignore the deep-seated divisions in society that came into existence with hierarchies and classes. One can no longer speak of humanity the way one can speak of species of carnivores or herbivores, that is, as groups of fairly uniform biological beings whose individuals are essentially alike. To use such ecumenical words as humanity, we, people, and the like in a purely biologistic sense, when we discuss social affairs, is grossly misleading. Although human beings are certainly mammals no less than bears, wolves or coyotes, to ignore the hierarchical and class divisions that second nature has produced in their midst is to create the illusion of a commonality that humanity has by no means achieved. This ecumenical view of the human species places young people and old women and men, poor and rich, exploited and exploiters, people of colour and whites, all on a par that stands completely at odds with social reality. Everyone in turn, despite the different burdens he or she is obliged to bear, is given the same responsibility for the ills of our planet be they starving Ethiopian children or corporate barons, all people are held to be equally culpable in producing present ecological problems. Ecological problems, in effect, are de-socialised and restated in genetic, psychological, personal and purely subjective terms so that they no longer have political or economic content. Not only does this conventional approach sidestep the profoundly social roots of present-day ecological dislocations, it deflects innumerable people from engaging in a practice that could yield effective social change. The tendency of mystical ecologists to speak of the ecological crises that we, or people, or humanity, have created, easily plays into the hands of a privileged stratum who are only too eager to blame all the human victims of an exploitative society for the social and ecological ills of our time. Political myopia of this kind, and the social insensitivity it breeds, is worse than naive. It is blatantly obfuscatory at best and utterly reactionary at worst. Accordingly, given the emergence of hierarchy and domination, the divisions that beset society are crucially important issues that the modern ecology movement must sternly confront and challenge. I must emphasize that we have to know how hierarchy arose if we are to undo it. We must explore the extensive nature of domination in all of its ramifications if we are to remove the pathologies of second nature, which we certainly cannot do unless we transcend naive biocentric views that equate humans with mosquitoes in terms of shared intrinsic worth whatever that expression may mean. Without a clear insight into the nature of hierarchy and domination, we will not only fail to understand how the social and biotic interact with each other, we will fail to realise that the very idea of dominating first nature has its origins in the domination of human by human, and we will lose what little understanding we have of the social origin of our most serious ecological problems. By the same token, 
we will grossly distort humanity's potentialities to play a creative role in non-human as well as human development. We will deprecate the fact, and such deprecation is already very chic among the theorists of deep ecology, that the human capacity to reason conceptually, to fashion tools and devise extraordinary technologies, indeed, to communicate themselves with a symbolic linguistic repertoire, all can be used for the good of the biosphere, not simply for harming it. What is of pivotal importance in determining whether human beings will creatively foster the evolution of first nature, or whether they will be highly destructive to non-human and human beings alike, is precisely the kind of society we establish, not only the kind of sensibility we develop. Which is not to say that in an ecological society, the lion will lie down with the lamb, or that the biosphere will be sedated into loving quietude with the balm of human kindness. But first nature can indeed be rendered biotically more fecund for non-human as well as human life, and the intervention of an ecologically oriented human rationality and techniques could foster many evolutionary advances. Advances that would diminish the damaging effects of the harmful accidents and chance events that can occur when evolution is left to so-called Mother Nature alone. Again, depending upon the kind of society we produce, a new realm of possibility may emerge in which blind necessity can be softened by clear-sighted rationality, and needless suffering can be diminished by human concern and care. Is this an argument for the belief, imputed by many biocentric ecologists to social ecology, that the human species is superior to or higher than all other life forms? That humans can dominate the biosphere? The use of the words superior and higher is willfully pejorative when they are applied by biocentrists to social ecology. If the terms are used to assert humanity's claim to a higher rank, station or authority, to cite the preferred dictionary definition of superior, any imputation that social ecology holds such a view is either the result of ignorance or is simply dishonest. For my part, Nowhere in any of my writings do I use the word superior to denote humans' relationship to non-human beings. That human beings differed significantly from non-human beings, however, is a fact that even the most naive mystics are obliged to acknowledge, short of losing all contact with reality. Given the constellation of differences that distinguish human from non-human life forms, indeed, differences that have been produced by natural evolution itself, it is fair to say that some species are more flexible than others in their ability to adapt, and that they possess more complex nervous systems and endow them with the capability to make more suitable choices from among evolutionary pathways that promote the survival and development. In short, they can be said to be more advanced in dealing with new situations than our other less flexible and less neurologically developed species. But in no sense does it follow that a more advanced life form will or must dominate less advanced life forms. The notion that a more advanced life form is more domineering is a thoroughly anthropomorphic image. It reflects elitist ideologies that justify domination, not relations that necessarily must exist in the natural, or for that matter in the social, world. 
It is a characteristic instance of the many ideologies of domination that have been projected onto first nature to establish, among other things, command and obedience as immutable facts of life. Indeed, one can argue that to the extent that human society becomes more rational, eliminates classes and hierarchies, and undergoes changes in sensibility that are marked by a deep respect for life, the less likely it is that terms like superior and higher will even have meaning to people, be it in their relationships with one another or in their relationships with other living beings. Indeed, the more fully developed humanity is, its spiritual and intellectual equipment refined by a rational culture, the more sensitive it will become in its view of and concern for non-human life. Because, greater reason, science, technology, even knowledge and talent have been historically yoked to the service of hierarchical rule, it seems to follow for many ecologically oriented people that they are antithetical to freedom, care, and an ecological outlook. We quail before words like technology, science, and logic as if they were totally autonomous, reified forces that have an oppressive character in every social context, irrespective of their ethical underpinnings, that animals more advanced than others need not that animals more advanced than others need not and actually do not dominate less advanced beings seems to totally elude adherence of mystical ecology and its theistic and deep offshoots. Here we arrive at one of the most hotly debated and at the same time one of the most sophistic issues in ecological philosophy today, the notion that intrinsic worth is equally distributed among all species. Where social ecology sees advances in evolutionary development, biocentric proponents of intrinsic worth see merely a scattering of morally equatable attributes among species such that the so-called rights of viruses to self-fulfillment can be equated with similar rights of grizzly bears, or such that the rights of grizzly bears can be equated with those of human beings. All, presumably, can be said to possess equal intrinsic worth. The obfuscations that these biocentric illusions and their misanthropic implications have introduced into present-day ecological thinking can hardly be underestimated. First, nature may reasonably be regarded as the ground for an ecological ethics, or, if you like, as the necessary condition for moral behaviour. Social ecology by conceiving first nature as an evolutionary tendency toward greater subjectivity, sees in the achievement of a rational, self-conscious and relatively free nature of the establishment of an ecological society. But, as I have often argued, first nature in itself is not ethical. Mother nature or whatever gendered kinship tie one may wish to assign to the planet, does not always know best, as the fossil remains of many remarkable but extinct species attest. In fact, it is doubtful that she knows anything at all, as even James Lovelock, the co-artificer of the so-called Gaia hypothesis attests. If one notes, for example, the amazing similarity between the stalking behaviour of a house-bred cat that has never eaten anything but canned cat food, 
and that of a lioness on the African plains. One may reasonably question whether even fairly advanced animals know much beyond what is imparted to them by their instincts and the rudimentary survival skills that they acquire from the very demanding challenges of eating and risking being eaten. Although the versatility of animal behaviour should not be downplayed, whatever most animals learn or know is usually limited by simple everyday experience and their relatively restricted forms of communication. As far as ethical issues are concerned, however, no animal or plant species has ever formulated a social contract with a mutual recognition of individual rights and duties, however complex their interactions may be. Despite the beliefs of writers like Kropotkin, who saw mutualistic relationships among life forms as harbingers of ethical behaviour, those relationships are not usually conscious ones, much less do they consist of the conscious responsibilities and the reasoned behaviour we call ethical. Indeed, the notion of so-called intrinsic worth in non-human nature is simply an oxymoron. Human beings may have a deep sense of care, empathy, indeed of love for other life forms, but for them to regard any ethical principle as inherent in first nature is as naive as the medieval practice of judicially trying and hanging captive wolves for their criminal behaviour. For better or worse, human beings are the sole ethical agents that exist. Ethics as such literally appeared on the planet with the emergence of human beings in the course of evolution, just as life as such appeared with the emergence of proteins that gained in metabolic and reproductive activity. Humans, and humans alone, institutionalise their own behaviour into relationships that are clearly predicated on acknowledged rights and duties, on rationally justified ethical responsibilities. As I show in this book, human ethical systems have been variously backed up by custom or traditional forms of behaviour, by morals or behaviour conducted by commands, or by reason or logical and conceptual thought. But even if we grant that these forms of behaviour differ considerably, humans have been entirely alone in a world as ethical agents, just as they have been alone in forming mutably institutionalised societies and the ideologies needed to support or change them. First nature is never cruel or kind, heartless or caring, good or bad. Ethics, in effect, was born with human society, just as surely as metabolism was born with the emergence of life. The intrinsic worth, or whatever other kind of value we impute to animals, are a product of human artifice that we project upon a world that in fact has no inherent values, just as in our fairy tales we project speech and human intentions onto bad wolves, shy pigs and sly foxes. The same is true of the rights that biocentrists attribute to life forms in the name of intrinsic worth, not to speak of streams, rocks, forests, mountains and so forth. Rights are never spontaneously generated in first nature, nor is there the least evidence that flora, fauna and rocks claim them, either for themselves or for others. Many animals exhibit care for each other, particularly in maternal offspring relationships among advanced life forms. But Mother Nature is singularly uncaring, taken as a whole, and is clearly bereft of ethical obligation. Much as we may want to metaphorically people the world with imminent or transcendental deities that anthropomorphically reflect our conceptions of ourselves 
and the kinds of communities we would like to develop, first nature still remains a realm of ethical vacuity. This vacuity can only be filled by the rights and obligations that humans consciously deliver to it. Any worth, value and rights that exist in first nature are conferred rights, rights that human beings alone confer on animals, plants, rocks, streams and the like. Rights cannot be derived from a mystical notion of intrinsic worth that simply has no meaning outside of human agency, nor have they ever preceded the appearance of humanity in natural evolution. Nor can it be argued that the life forms in first nature are suffused with mutual respect for one another. No non-human organism respects Mother Nature, or even knows that she exists as anything more than a habitat. In fact, each animal species simply tries to survive. It has no evident regard for the worth, intrinsic or otherwise, of its environment or of the other life forms that inhabit it. Wolves would devour the last caribou alive if they were hungry, and ungulates would nip away the last remaining patches of vegetation on earth if they required food. We would be hard put to explain the tremendous trail of species extinctions from Cambrian times, some half billion years ago, up to the Pleistocene epoch, were it not for the fact that predation, as well as geophysical factors, drove countless life forms out of existence with no evidence of mutual respect, earth wisdom, or a sensibility based on intrinsic worth. I am not arguing that we should not confer rights, possibly even judicial ones, as Justice William O. Douglas tried to do, on non-human species or even on forests, streams and certain geological formations, for that matter. From a practical standpoint, doing so might be an invaluable way of conserving and expanding eco-communities that we should preserve for a good many reasons that I need not discuss here. But the fact that a highly perverted society has shown little willingness to respect the non-human world should not be used as the basis for defaming the one life form, human beings, that alone is capable of even thinking, discussing, and with the needed social changes, effectively conferring rights on first nature. Whatever rights or other ethical formulations that we develop in an ecological ethics, the fact remains that we, as a species, are the sole ethical agents on the planet who are able to formulate these rights to confer them and to see that they are upheld. Whether these rights are formulated and upheld, I must insist, depends overwhelmingly upon the kind of society we create and the sensibility it fosters. Not by mystifying a remarkably unknowing or indifferent mother nature, or believing in an earth goddess who has no more reality than the anthropomorphic fables of Mother Goose. Insofar as human beings alone have an unprecedented capacity to create ethical systems that impart worth to other life forms, they clearly have a special worth in their own right, insofar as they are capable of being fully conscious of their behaviour and its ecological impact. They are extraordinary beings in the biosphere, for no other life form has this remarkable consciousness. The very misanthropic indulgences that grossly undervalue human beings by claiming that Gaia can thrive without them are as stupid as they are despicable. This claim strips organic evolution of any meaning whatever beyond mere survival, of any exaltation in the natural emergence 
are attributes like conceptual thought and symbolic language. By placing the capabilities of human beings and their intellectuality on a par with animal skills for survival, biocentrists utterly denigrate that unique species as well as intellectuality itself. With so limited and reductionist an interpretation of life, one might well wonder why Gaia itself should be cherished amidst the cosmic swirl of marvellous galaxies and celestial bodies. The insidious devaluation of human achievements promoted by mystical ecologies is accompanied by a hatred of all that is specifically human, a hatred of reason, science, art and technological innovation in almost all of its forms. To claim, as one deep ecologist has recently done, that the human mind is morally comparable to the, quote, navigational skills of birds, the sonar capability of dolphins, and the intense sociality of ants, unquote, is to ignore the fact that the human mind knows more about the specific attributes of these animals than do the animals themselves. Moreover, humans, by virtue of their intellectuality and technical abilities, have the capability of understanding these attributes to the point that they can invent ways to duplicate them and even surpass their range. Underlying our deep ecologist's judgment, or lack thereof, is a fashionable disdain for the potentialities and creativity of mind, a disdain that has its social roots in an Anglo-American tradition of empiricism, the prevailing mystical zeitgeist, a privatistic reaction to an increasingly overbearing society, and an emerging temper of self-hatred that is projected onto human life itself with a predictable, compensatory reverence for non-human nature. If one grants that ethics is an eminently human creation, that human beings can add a sense of meaning to first nature by virtue of their interpretive powers, that they can confer values as well as create them, then humanity is literally the very embodiment of a value in nature as a whole. However much Gaia might be able to survive without the existence of human beings, such a Gaia would have no more ethical meaning or value in the scheme of things than a meteorite. As the embodiment of value, indeed as the very source of value, a human life can no more be placed on a par with the life of a grizzly bear or a wolf than the lives of those admirable animals can be placed on a par with the existence of an inorganic entity like a rock. For the disappearance of human beings, value too would disappear, and the biosphere would be left with no basis for any ethical evaluation or discussion of intrinsic worth, much less ethical agents who can appreciate its wondrous qualities. Hence the exceptional importance of human life, even by comparison with the noblest of all other life forms. Let me stress once again that in no way does this valuation of human life contradict an ethics of complementarity. An ethics of complementarity opposes any claim that human beings have a right to dominate first nature, assuming they could do so in the first place, much less than any claim that first nature has been created to serve human needs. But such an ethics does place a high premium on a rich diversity of life that makes for wholeness, for evolutionary and rational innovation, and for a heterogeneity of life forms, if only to make complementarity possible.
as an ethics that values the emergence of new attributes implicit in life, such a greater flexibility of adaptations to new environments. It gives due recognition to more advanced degrees of sentience, and, if you please, the exercise and joys of mind, self-consciousness and freedom. But in no sense does it place these attributes of life in any hierarchical system based on command and obedience. A world reduced to Lynn Margulis's soup of prokaryotic cells, or to Starker Leopold's admittedly illusory version of a primitive American habitat in Yellowstone Park, would indeed be alive, but it would be little more than that. It would lack humanity's ability to appreciate it, to give it the splendour of meaning, to enrich it with interpretation, indeed, even to create illusions of its sacredness. In the absence of human beings, reality would be denied the rich sense of wonder so characteristic of mind, and the sensibility that could bring mind to the surface of fostering the very interconnectedness so celebrated by mystical ecologists. Herein lies the extraordinary value of human life in relation to other forms of life, namely its ability to value phenomena and evolution in any broad ethical sense. If the reader chooses, as our deep ecologists do, to respond to my humanistic observations by sneeringly asking, who says so? I can only reply to their very ability to ask such questions, is evidence of the view I have advanced. If we are of the natural evolution that produced us, yet also apart from it, in what ways should we deal with that apartness? Mystical ecologists would like us to try to overcome human apartness by minimising or eliminating it altogether. It has become all too fashionable among many mystical ecologists to condemn human intervention into first nature, except to meet the minimal needs of life and survival. We are enjoined to let nature take its course, to avoid any alteration of first nature, except for what is necessary, a word that often remains ill-defined, to keep human beings alive and well. Such non-interventionist attitudes are commonly imputed to prehistoric and Aboriginal peoples, who presumably lived in total oneness with first nature and the wildlife around them. Taking Aldo Leopold's phrase, not man apart, to its most extreme conclusion, mystical ecologists call for a complete integration into first nature, by returning to the Pleistocene, as many biocentrists demand. But these calls present us with a host of vexing problems. In the first place, the Pleistocene was not the Paleolithic, although they are often grouped together for geological convenience. Hence, we are talking of diverse sensibilities and cultures. It was not until the late Pleistocene that the vocal anatomy of Homo erectus, a direct ancestor of our species, allowed for speech. Before then, any deep ecologists who hoped to return to that epoch would have been confined to grunts and growls. Nor was it until the late Paleolithic that human beings like ourselves, Homo sapiens, who had modern type anatomies and brains, emerged. The families and communities of the hunting, gathering foragers, who lived in the glacial and interglacial periods of the Pleistocene, were equipped with little more technology than spears, fire, crude stone scrapers, and the like, for hunting animals and cleaning their hides. 
a technics that would exclude the word processes to which many deep ecologist writers were avowedly attached. Disturbingly, we know that Homo erectus, direct ancestors of our species who lived in the late Pleistocene, were probably cannibals who ate members of their own species, possibly, but not necessarily, for ritualistic reasons. These forebears of our species and our own ancestors lived in a climactically turbulent era, marked by advances and retreats of glaciers, wild swings in temperature, and a feast or famine diet. Their lives were often very precarious, despite the periodic abundance of game. Nor were they fully equipped with the means to deal with the natural vicissitudes that white middle-class people today take so readily for granted, such as the certainty of warmth in cold weather, adequate shelter, and the ordinary creature comforts to which middle-class people are wedded, leaving all luxuries and pleasures aside. They lacked a written body of knowledge by which a complex tradition of ideas could be handed down. The writing materials with which to express thoughts and reflections that were more complex than those involved in meeting the needs of everyday life. The libraries in which to meditate, research and gather the wisdom of past ages. In short, the vast array of intellectual and spiritual materials to sensitise their outlook and sensibilities. It might seem more plausible for deep ecologists to call for a return to the sensibility of these distant times, rather than an actual physical return. But here, too, we are besieged by a barrage of unanswered questions. We would want to know what kind of sensibility Pleistocene and Paleolithic hunters had in their dealings with the multitude of animals they encountered in the Great Age of Mammals, as the two periods have been called. After all, Paleolithic hunter-gatherers developed the stone-tipped spear, the all-important spear-thrower, which made it possible to effectively pierce very tough hides and muscles, and the bow and arrow, which could inflict mortal damage over a sizable distance. The more sophisticated and lethal their hunting kit, the greater an impact these humans must have had on the large mammals of the late Pleistocene and the Paleolithic. If we are to return to the sensibility of these epochs, we would want to know if they really viewed the animals they killed reverentially, as so many mystical ecologists claim, or if they had a more pragmatic attitude toward them, using magic to propitiate a bison spirit or bear spirit in rituals before and after kills. We would want to know if they really did feel themselves to be absorbed into an all-encompassing oneness with the animals around them, or whether they had any sense of human self-identity that involved feelings of apartness from those animals. We would want to know if they really chose not to intervene in First Nature any more than was absolutely necessary, as mystical ecologists believe, or if they significantly altered the surroundings. We would want to know if they really did behave toward wildlife as tender carnivores in pursuit of sacred game, as Paul Shepard's evocative book on hunter-gatherer sensibility is titled or if they held a more mundane attitude toward animals as means for satisfying their very material as well as subjective needs. Actually, we will never know with certainty the answers to these questions of sensibility. The outlook that today's mystical ecologists cultivate toward the Pleistocene, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, is often highly romanticised and certainly does not correspond to many things that we do know about those eras. 
If I am to examine the nature of Aboriginal sensibilities, I must do so as honestly as possible and decide which characterizations probably apply better to our ancestors of the distant past. This much is clear. Much of the archaeological evidence does not support the ecological romantic view of early peoples. However unpleasant the data may be, researchers have argued with good reason, for example, that effective human hunters in the Pleistocene may have played a major role in killing off some, if not most, of the great Pleistocene and Paleolithic mammals. Which is not to deny that others have claimed that climatic changes with important ecological consequences in the Pleistocene and Paleolithic are more likely to have ended forever the lives of mammoths, mastodons, woolly rhinoceroses, cave bears, and giant sloths, among others. The argument that the Pleistocene and Paleolithic animals became extinct solely because changes in climate and temperature caused the flora and fauna on which they thrived to disappear has been seriously challenged by a number of responsible researchers. Paul S. Martin, for one, has championed the view that it was prehistoric hunters who caused the, quote, sudden wave of large animal extinctions, unquote, at the end of the Pleistocene, a wave that, quote, involved at least 200 genera, most of them without phyletic replacement, unquote. His largely speculative arguments are based more on the correlation between the extinctions and the appearance of human hunters than on factual evidence. This has led other researchers, like Calvin Martin in his popular Keepers of the Game, to contend that in North America, large mammals such as the mastodon were often so dependent for subsistence on spruce fir ecosystems that when those ecosystems began to disappear, some eight to 10,000 years ago, the animals could no longer sustain themselves. That a very intelligent mammal, like a member of the elephant family, would have been limited to such a narrow ecological niche, however, is highly doubtful. And in fact, very recent, 1991, Evidence from the intestinal remains of a well-preserved mastodon reveals that the animal was quite capable of living on swamp-like vegetation in an ecosystem very different from that of a spruce fir region. In fact, Calvin Martin to the contrary, mastodons were probably quite capable of flourishing in a variety of ecological niches. Such evidence throws factual weight on the side of the overkill, as distinguished from the primarily climatic approach, and supports the view that early hunter-gatherers contributed to or may have exterminated many Pleistocene animals. After so much has been written by romantics of the last century and mystical ecologists today, about the oneness that pre-literate peoples felt for the game they hunted, should we be shocked by this conclusion? I believe not, unless we choose to simplify the complex dialectic involved in what we regard as an ecological sensibility, whether that sensibility applies to prehistoric and aboriginal hunters or to ourselves. Indeed, that early hunters, whose ecological sensibility is so revered by mystical ecologists, would try to satisfy their needs in any way they could, should not surprise us. In fact, these hunters were predatory opportunists no less than wolves or coyotes, precisely because they were very much part of nature. 
to invoke that much abused word. Just as were all the life forms around them, early hunters did not live in Disneyland, where sociable mice and gleeful rabbits jostle with human visitors in a pseudo animistic, cartoon like world. Another area in dispute is the extent to which pre literate peoples altered the wild environments in which they lived. We know that early hunters were clearly not devout conservers of the original forests, for example. As Stephen J. Pine emphasizes in his informative study, Fire in America, quote, The virgin forest was not encountered in the 16th and 17th century. It was invented in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. For this condition, Indian fire practices were largely responsible. Unquote. Hunter-gatherer foragers, in fact, used fire on a global scale to create grasslands for herbivores. The great prairies of the Midwest were literally created by Indian torches, which were systematically applied long before those lands were expropriated by Europeans. Since humanity's discovery of fire, few forests that we call virgin remain today, however large the girth or height of their individual trees. Great forests of the 18th century were often restorations of trees that have been cleared and reduced to parkland and prairies in pre-Columbian times. The forest primeval that Longfellow celebrated in his poetry was often made up of trees that European settlers had permitted to come back after Indians had turned the forests and the areas they occupied into parklands. That European settlers permitted the trees to return in order to use them to build ships and homes does not alter the fact that these forests were anything but primeval, or that Indian communities were anything but reluctant to tamper with nature. The wildlife that the grasslands and forests supported were often hunted unrelentingly, sometimes in gross disregard of their dwindling members, long after Paleo-Indians contributed to the extinction of Pleistocene megafauna. Their descendants killed elk in bunches or groups by hunting down a female bunch leader first, then picking off the remaining animals while they haplessly milled around in circles. Countless bison were stampeded off cliffs, corralled in ravines, or otherwise trapped and killed in numbers that seemed to have far exceeded what was necessary to meet the needs of their hunters. Large killings were inflicted wherever possible on elk, pronghorns, mountain goats and caribou. My point here should be clearly understood. It is not my intention to defame Aboriginal hunters or to place their behaviour on a par with that of lumber companies or the meatpacking industry. No Paleo-Indian and Indian overkills and deforestation compares, even remotely, to the terrifying ecological devastation and the genocide practised by Euro-American settlers on the New World and its native people. The greed and exploitation that has destroyed Indian cultures over the past five centuries can in no way be justified morally or culturally. The interaction of European settlers and Native Americans could have opened a new opportunity for a sensitive integration of both cultures, but that opportunity was lost in an orgy of bloodletting and plunder by European settlers, particularly land speculators, railroaders, lumber barons, and capitalist entrepreneurs generally. But with all due regard to the many remarkable features of Native American cultures, 
pre-Columbian hunters took a large toll in wildlife, often showing few, if any, concerns for conservation. From such overkills, game animals took years to regenerate, nor was this regeneration helped by their hunters' fertility rituals, unless we are to naively believe, like modern believers in magic, that they serve to increase animal fertility. Thanks to their hunting prowess, observes Alston Chase in his superbly researched and well-written book, Playing God in Yellowstone, the Indians of the Yellowstone region, the Shoshone and their cousins, the Bannock and the Lemmy, had eaten themselves out of house and home. When Lewis and Clark first met the Shoshone in 1805, they were starving. Their chief told the explorers that they had nothing but berries to eat. Unquote. I will not dwell further on the recorded instances where overkill by Aboriginal hunters denuded large areas of wildlife or burned away so-called primeval flora. In short, intervened significantly into so-called primeval environments long before technology had advanced much further than a Stone Age toolkit. It is beyond doubt to me, as it is seemingly not to many mystical ecologists, that prehistoric and preliterate peoples intervened in first nature as fully as they could and often changed it quite profoundly. Their intervention ranged in scope from overkills in wildlife to the creation of grasslands and even to the building of cities like Tenochtitlan in Aztec Mexico and terraces in the Andean highlands, or in pre-Columbian times. These are facts that are hardly disputed seriously. Apart from the wishful thinking of romantics and mystics, the differences that surround these facts are more to do with the details or scale of the interventions than with the reality of considerable intervention itself. But I cannot reiterate my point too strongly. Far from seeking to defame Aboriginal peoples, I think we must examine the rationale for their seeming insensitivity to animal life and forests. Hunter-gatherers were living beings like other life forms, and as any life form would, they tried to survive by any means possible. At the same time, the needs of these humans were greater and more complex than those of other life forms. As creatures endowed by natural evolution with highly intelligent minds, they would not only have required animal and vegetable food to meet their immediate needs, they would also have wanted a secure supply of food once they knew how to preserve meat and plants. Owing to their naturally endowed intelligence, they would have wanted good clothing, even luxuries such as comfortable bedding, sturdy skin for homes, plumage and carved bone amulets, bead-like teeth for ornaments, magical artefacts, an assortment of tools and medicines, and colouring matter for various purposes. That the needs of these humans were greater and more complex than those of other life forms was due not to any perverse traits, but to endowments that stemmed from their evolution as unique animals. These wants, in short, shaped their behaviour, as it would have shaped that of any non-human being, and these wants were a product of an intelligence that had been formed as a result of eons of evolutionary development, not any demonic or mysterious impulse that is vaguely unnatural. Inasmuch as preliterate people were human, moreover, they were capable of reasoning conceptually, of speaking fluently, and of feeling abiding insecurities. Early humanity can hardly be faulted 
for behaving more intelligently than bears, foxes, and wolves. Natural evolution endowed them with larger brains and the capacity for making tools and weapons to enhance their powers of survival and for changing their environment to abet their well-being. They had amazing memories and of extreme importance. They possessed vivid imaginations. They decorated their weapons, painted animals and designs on rocks and caves, engaged in analogic thinking, created myths, and felt passions often incomparably more compelling than any that are discernible in animals. Yet they are also truly parts of nature. In the late Pleistocene and early Paleolithic, it was their very closeness to first nature, coupled with their emerging second nature, that would have caused them to act in ways that contradict our present-day romanticized notions of their behavior. They were undergoing a major transition from the domain of biological evolution to that of social evolution. As such. They could variously exhibit utter indifference to the pain they inflicted on animals, and a strong affinity for them in their rituals. Contradictory forms of behavior that occurred almost simultaneously. In these respects, their sensibility was shaped by animalistic as well as cultural needs. Indeed, by their very oneness with first nature. In turn. Their sense of oneness with first nature was shaped by a mental repertoire that could make for what we today would regard as cruelty, as well as empathy toward non-human life, depending upon the extent to which they identified themselves with it, and the kind of society they created, which led to a sense of apartness from it, a thoroughly dialectical tension in their outlook. Allow me to illustrate this point with just one of many examples that can be culled from the anthropological literature. Colin M. Turnbull, a noted anthropologist and author of an outstanding study of the Ituri forest pygmies in Central Africa, the forest people, celebrates the almost reverential feeling these people genuinely had for their forest habitat. Yet Turnbull was appalled when he discovered that they could be very indifferent to the suffering of captive animals. Quote, "The cindula is one of the most prized animals." Unquote. Turnbull tells us, speaking of a tasty dog-like creature that the pygmies had caught in a hunting net, left in the custody of a pygmy boy, Maipe. He continues, quote, "The youngster, probably not much more than thirteen years old, had speared it with his first thrust, pinning the animal to the ground through the fleshy part of the stomach. But the animal was still very much alive, fighting for freedom. It had already bitten its way through the net, and now it was doubled up, gashing the spear shaft with its sharp teeth." Maipe put another spear into its neck, but it still writhed and fought. Not until a third spear pierced its heart did it give up the struggle. It was at times like this that I found myself furthest removed from the pygmies. They stood around in an excited group, pointing at the dying animal and laughing. One boy, about nine years old. Threw himself on the ground and curled up in a grotesque heap, and imitated the singular's last convulsions. The men pulled their spears out and joked with one another about being afraid of a little animal like that. And to emphasize this point, one of them kicked the torn and bleeding body. Then Maipe's mother came and swept the blood-streaked animal up by its hind legs. And threw it over her shoulder, onto the basket on her back. At other times, I have seen pygmies singeing feathers 
off birds that were still alive, explaining that the meat is more tender if death comes slowly, and the hunting dogs, valuable as they are, get kicked around mercilessly from the day they were born to the day they die. I have never seen any attempt at the domestication of any animal or bird apart from the hunting dog. When I talked to the pygmies about their treatment of animals, they laughed at me and said, The forest has given us animals for food. Should we refuse this gift and starve? I thought of turkey farms and Thanksgiving, and of the millions of animals reared by our own society with the sole intention of slaughtering them for food. Unquote. Behaviour of this kind, and the sensibility it reveals, are by no means peculiar to the Ituri forest pygmies. To torture animals, or men and women captives, in intertribal conflicts, was regarded as routine behaviour among a large number of preliterate peoples. Pigs were often beaten to death in Oceania, dogs were grossly maltreated by some Indian peoples who regarded them as tasty delicacy, and they were often treated harshly by ordinary gentle Eskimos, as is attested in many reports over decades. Ethnological accounts of animism and magic tell us, in fact, that for many hunting-gathering cultures, second nature was still so deeply immersed in first nature that preliterate people could draw relatively little distinction between themselves and their environments. Not surprisingly, the distinctions between first and second nature were often problematical, with the result that the ability to achieve a clearly defined sense of human self-identity or ego was fairly limited. In short, we cannot resolve the issue of humanity's apartness from first nature by trying to eliminate apartness in the course of apotheosizing a Pleistocene oneness or imitating a contrived notion of primordial sensibilities. Looking back to the very beginnings of second nature, it should be emphasised that humanity's consciousness of first nature has distinguished from a consciousness of its specific, narrow ecological niches, presupposes that it separate itself from a purely niche-like animal existence. Human beings, at some point, had to at least begin to see first nature generally as an other, if their self-identity and self-consciousness as human beings were to emerge. Without a sense of contrast between the human and non-human, people are limited to the bedrock of existence of seeking mere survival, to a way of life so undifferentiated from that of other living things that they know little more than the unmediated confines of their limited ecological community. This way of life is bereft of purpose, meaning or orientation, apart from what people create in their imagination, and it is a way of life that no human being could endure except by ceasing to think. Which is to say that, epistemologically at least, differentiation would not exist and the evolution of a human psyche would never get underway. In order for human beings to differentiate themselves in natural evolution, there must be duality, such as dualities between self and other and between the human and the non-human. Here, duality must not be confused with dualism. Today, in fact, the danger that confronts ecological thinking is less a matter of a dualistic sensibility, a dualism that mystical ecologists have criticised to the point of pulverisation, but of reductionism an intellectual dissolution of all difference into an undefinable oneness, an intellectual dissolution of all difference 
into an undefinable oneness that excludes the possibility of creativity and turns a concept like interconnectedness into the bonds of a mental and emotional straitjacket. Without otherness, duality and differentiation, interconnectedness dissolves psychological and personal heterogeneity into a night in which all cows are black, to use one of Hegel's favoured aphorisms. The same criticism can be levelled at an ontological reductionism. Without otherness, duality and differentiation, all heterogeneity of life forms would be limited to a deadening homogeneity and organic evolution could not have occurred. In terms of natural history, the biosphere would indeed still be a Gaia, covered by Margulis's soup of prokaryotic cells. Today, to follow a mystical path to oneness, is to sink back into the timeless, ahistorical, misty island of the lotus eaters, who in Homer's Odyssey have no recollection of a past and no vision of a future, but vegetate in an unperturbable existence that consists of eating, digesting and defecating, like animals that live on a strictly day-to-day basis. This is a world that has no sense of otherness, no sense of self, no sense of consciousness, indeed no sensibility at all beyond the mere maintenance of life, presumably in the bosom of an equally vacuous cosmic self. To understand early sensibilities and their development, we must acknowledge that humanity had to break with the purely animalistic sensibility. If it can be called sensibility at all, that had confined it to a mere ecological niche, if it was to enter into and know the larger world around it. Human beings had to regard first nature as other, as they inevitably did, however much romantics of all sorts bemoaned the loss of a universal oneness in a golden Pleistocene, Paleolithic, or Neolithic past. Given their naturally endowed potentialities, humans had to go beyond a realm of mere survival into one of creativity and innovation, and satisfy their naturally endowed capacity to adapt environments to meet their own needs. In time, hopefully, along rational and ecological lines. The terrible psychological upheavals produced by the 20th century have made us truly wary of social history, of otherness, of the dualities of separation from non-human nature. But separation and otherness are human facts of life, if only because natural evolution has produced a life form, humanity, whose very specificity is premised on a conscious sense of separation that can increasingly distinguish human from non-human reality. Otherness must be conceived of as a graded phenomenon, to be sure, one that may result in any of several kinds of society. It may eventuate in very destructive relationships characterised by opposition, domination and antagonism as we know today, the results of which stain the social history that lies behind us and possibly the precarious future that lies before us. But otherness may also take the form of differentiation, of articulation, of complementarity as it did in the early history of humanity. As human beings began to emerge from first nature, 
Possibly in the Pleistocene and certainly in the Paleolithic, their relationship to animals as others was largely complementary. Hunters know that they are dealing with a non-human other. But as I emphasized in this book many years ago, animism may have been a form of solicitation rather than coercion. Early animism imparted a cooperative impulse to these cultures, despite the fact that animal spirits had to be propitiated. Game, it was assumed, could then be lured to accept the hunter's spears and arrows, as Paleolithic cave paintings suggest. Even the overkills of the late Pleistocene and early Paleolithic may have arisen not from a sense of the other as an opponent or foe, but from a naive ignorance of the ecological impact these overkills would have on the great Pleistocene megafauna. In this respect, early hunters merely combined the behaviours of an ordinary animal predator with that of an increasingly socialised, animistic human being. After the climatic vicissitudes that marked the Pleistocene epoch, the environment became more stable for human beings, and with the beginnings of horticulture, when preliterate people settled into permanent village lifeways, early cultures generally seem to have entered into a remarkably balanced relationship with the flora and fauna around them in the Near East and the Americas. Certainly in the Americas, the marvellous abundance of wildlife and many of the magnificent forests reveal that a fair degree of ecological stability marked Indian cultures when whites made contact with new regions of the Americas. Their sense of otherness was probably more consciously benign and complementary, based on differentiation rather than opposition. It was rooted in a simple notion of the world as variegated, diversified, and basically ecological. I may add, in passing, that it is precisely this latter period upon which the second chapter of this book, The Outlook of Organic Society, focuses, and not only for the Americas, but the early Neolithic Near East. From that very human recognition of their own selves and of natural differences, however, a variegated social history developed, one that included the emergence of hierarchy. Here, the otherness of complementarity was often subverted by emerging status groups and slowly gave way to otherness based on domination. But the otherness of complementarity and the otherness of domination existed together and interacted with each other, so that second nature's evolution began to unfold very equivocally. Despite our rightful wariness of the social history of hierarchy and domination, however, ecologically oriented people today cannot ignore the compelling realities of this social history in its entirety, neither its many blemishes nor the many unfulfilled alternatives that it offered for a better world in the past and present, and hopefully that it will still offer in the future, including reason, science and technology, with their promise for an ecological society. Today, we still have to go beyond existing second nature to fulfil the potentiality of combining first and second nature in a new synthesis that I have elsewhere called free nature. Should this free nature ever come into existence, enriched by the differentiations that mark first and second nature, we could hope to achieve a new sense of otherness with first nature that is neither biocentric nor anthropocentric, but complementary, between non-human and human, in a richly articulated unity, drenched in the sunlight of evolution, not submerged in the darkness 
of a mythic Pleistocene or a Gaian soup of a simple unicellular organisms. Let me sum up my views quite explicitly. I regard it as a form of ahistorical arrogance, so characteristic of recent times, to look back at preliterate peoples' behaviour and cast it in forms that suit modern standards of ecological morality, or respond with pious disappointment to their cruelty or indifference to other living beings. It is a form of modern ahistorical arrogance to expect that they would not use their environments up to the hilt or change them as they needed to. What we should properly ask if we are not to sink into the fatuities of romanticism and mysticism is not whether humans should intervene into nature, for nothing will stop them from trying to fulfil their most basic natural potentialities, but how they should intervene and toward what ends. These are really the profoundly ethical questions that we must ask, and they can only be answered in a thinking way, by unscrambling the virtues and vices of humanity's social development, by determining if evolution has any meaningful thrust toward increased subjectivity and consciousness in the great evolutionary parade of life forms, and by bringing greater mind to bear on the pivotal role of social development in all of these issues. That many of us, including important thinkers in past generations, have the luxury of questioning hierarchical society's interaction with nature, including human nature itself, is the result not of a newly discovered affinity we have with animal life. Valid as this affinity may be, it arises mainly from our growing sense of humanity, our enlarged sense of humanistic empathy with non-human life forms, not to speak of other human beings. I cannot emphasize too often that no life forms seem to be capable of sharing our empathetic sentiments. Except where parental care is involved, and possibly for members of the pack, herd or band to which they belong. Allowance can also be made for sentiments of affinity that some animals feel for the humans who care for them as pet owners or shepherds. And to use a word like empathy for such cases can only be done in a very anthropomorphic manner, on the dubious assumption that instinct, habitat and conditioned reflexes do not play a major role in forming empathetic animal behaviour. As for the sentiments of empathy, care and concern that humans extend so broadly to multitudes of living species, indeed to nature as a whole, let me emphasise again that these sentiments are not to be found in first nature. Animals have no idea of what nature is, any more than did our early ancestors, who were too immersed in it to grasp the natural world as a totality or a vast otherness, if you will. They could see little beyond their particular ecological niche and the beings that shared it with them. Moreover, if human sensibilities do not draw a distinction between humanity and nature, if they do not attain the self-definition, self-consciousness and self-fulfilment for which people have been equipped by natural evolution, they will always lack the empathy, care, aesthetic appreciation and affinity for the first nature that the ecological movement demands of them. Nor could humans have ever become moral agents who can know first nature and appreciate it, much less create a free nature that creatively absorbs the best of first and second nature into a realm of social wholeness and ethical complementarity. <laughs>
The attainment of free nature will involve neither the re-enchantment, the re-divinization, nor the mystification of nature, whether by means of John Muir's inverted Calvinism, Starhawk's magical arts, Gregory Bateson's cybernetics, or deep ecology's appeal that we dissolve ourselves into a cosmic self. Nor will free nature be attained by a professoriate or by essayists, poets, anthropologists and ecological evangelists who tap out encomiums to hard work and a simple life on their word processors. The moral cant that marks the recent reworking of the ecology movement into a wilderness cult, a network of Wiccan covens, fervent acolytes of earth goddess religions, and assorted psychotherapeutic countergroups, beggars description. For all their talk about self-empowerment, theistic imminence, care, and interconnectedness, such mystics actually manage to navigate themselves away from the serious social issues that underlie the present ecological crisis and retreat to strategies of personal self-transformation and enrichment that are predicated on myths, metaphors, rituals and green consumerism. A respect and love for first nature has no need for such artifices, artifacts, atavistic practices, or romantic somersaults, much less the growing number of misanthropes whose love of non-human life often seems to stem from a detestation of human life. Natural evolution, given its marvellous creativity, its fecundity, its growing subjectivity, and its capacity for innovation, deserves our respect and love for its own attributes. We do not have to create ideological artifacts like deities, female or male, or use magical arts to appreciate first nature as a wondrous phenomenon, including such wonders as the human mind and humanity's capacity to act morally and self-consciously. An appreciation and love of first nature should properly stem from a clear-sighted and aesthetic naturalism, not from a supernaturalism with its projection of sovereign human-like beings into the biotic world and its canny use of terms like imminence and earth-groundedness. Indeed, whether we truly know and fully appreciate first nature depends very much on having the intellectual and emotional ability not to confuse ourselves as human beings, with coyotes, bears or wolves, much less with insensate things like rocks or rivers, or even more absurdly, with the cosmos. Whether this clear-eyed naturalism will become prevalent in the present-day ecology movement is now very much in doubt. One can easily understand and fully appreciate women's resentment of Judeo-Christian patriarchalism, militaristic belief systems, and the neglect of their identity by a male-oriented world. But for women, or men for that matter, to react to these social and psychological pathologies by adopting a neo-pagan mysticism, an all-loving pantheism, or a barely concealed matriarchalism, is to replace one body of errors by another, and possibly one social and psychological tyranny by another. Falsehoods and dogmatic beliefs, however benign they may seem at first glance, inevitably imprison the mind and diminish its critical thrust. They presuppose and foster a proclivity for faith, whose arbitrary nature renders their acolytes easily manipulable by assorted New Age gurus, priests, priestesses, witches, and orchestrators of mass culture. For early hunters themselves, their animistic sensibility was a mixed blessing. 
Clearly, it featured a cooperative spirit in their relations to animals as others, and it certainly alerted hunters to the attributes of the animals they stalked. Nevertheless, however much preliterate people's animism includes a cooperative dimension, we know today that insofar as it rests on the belief in spirits or a supernature, it clearly rests on a false image of the natural world. Besides boxing them into inflexible customs and traditions, animism involves an innocent belief in magic that rendered Aboriginal peoples very vulnerable to technology, particularly the weaponry of Europeans who awed them or, with their bullets, bloodily disabused them of the spells with which their shamans had so-called protected them. To believe that animism has any objective reality, as many mystical ecologists suggest, is simply infantile, not unlike the behaviour of a child who angrily kicks a stool when he or she falls over it. In view of what we know today about first nature, animistic souls and magical methods have no more basis in objective reality than divisions that many North American Indians traditionally induced in themselves by fasting, self-torture, auto-suggestion, and similar techniques that distort the human sensorium. In a preliterate community, inducing a vision of a guardian spirit by warping one's senses might enhance one's own sense of self-worth, courage, and bravado, thereby making one a better hunter. But these visions tell us no more about the reality of first nature than Castaneda's tales about talking animals. Mythic knowledge and the belief in magic, so important to animism, are a self-delusion, one that is understandable as the beliefs of preliterate peoples, but among modern people that are explicable only as evidence of the extent to which they are removed from reality. Indeed, the extent to which they lack authentic, so-called Earth wisdom. Given the growth of ritual as part of the ecology movement and particularly eco-feminism, we should be wise to realise that ritualistic behaviour can render people easy to control for many dubious ends. That there are desirable rituals that ease our transitions into different age groups and that prepare us for new responsibilities in life, cement communities, alleviate our sense of loss for the dead, reinforce human solidarity, and even express respect for non-human life. All of these are forms of behaviour that social ecology readily acknowledges. But ritualistic behaviour must be practised knowingly. Indeed, more so today than has ever been the case in the past, because the mass media have made us terribly vulnerable to new methods of social control. Our need for all the critical faculties we can muster is heightened by the enormous magnitude of the ecological problems we face. If rituals are used to a point where they foster a non-critical approach to reality, or create an illusory substitute for it, if magical trickery becomes a substitute for a rationally explicable kind of causality, if new shamans apply their nostrums to the most intimate areas of life so that it is they, not us, who determine our behaviour, the participant can easily become a malleable object rather than an autonomous subject. Ironically, I may add, in the name of attaining a new, collective, cosmic or ecological subjectivity. Participants in a ritual of interconnectedness who come to believe that they are trees, for example, engage in an act of blatant self-deception that may easily diminish their self-identity. 
The potential damage caused by this loss of ego boundaries is all the more frightening because selfhood is already being weakened and rendered passive by a highly commodified society. Thus, although ritual can be used to alleviate many transitional crises in life, it can also be used very effectively to take over life, to freeze it in manufactured so-called traditions, not unlike the Nazi rituals at Nuremberg, indoctrinate and totally subjugate the individual to a new political and psychological tyranny. The generous utopian ambience that surrounded the ecology movement of the 1960s, with its concern for people as well as the biosphere, is steadily giving way to a dystopian bitterness and misanthropy. Ecology is seriously faced with the danger that it will become mean-spirited and arrogant in its treatment of genuinely denied people. For all their celebrations of Mother Earth, mystical ecologies generally deal with her as though she had withered breasts and had lost her powers of reproduction. Often knowingly, this tendency in the ecology movement has all but abandoned the commitment of authentic radical movements, socialist and anarchist alike, to human happiness. Radical ecology's earlier confrontational stance toward capitalism and hierarchical society has been increasingly replaced by cries against technology and industrial society, two very safe, socially neutral targets against which even the bourgeoisie can invade in Earth Day celebrations. As long as minimal attention is paid to the social relations in which the mechanization of society is rooted, radical criticisms of the patently class-biased views of Thomas Malthus are being replaced by anguished cries about the population problem, as though modern capitalism, given its competitive market economy, would not ravage the planet even if the world's population were reduced to a fraction of its present numbers. The political vigour of the earlier ecology movement is being sapped by religious or quasi-religious cults. An encounter group mentality of the personal as political and mystical vagaries as a substitute for serious reflection and social analysis. The popularity of biocentrism, in turn, threatens to trivialise humanity, particularly its capacity for moral agency in nature. Ironically, the very intellectual and psychological capacity that is essential to develop a biocentric outlook. Aside from the misanthropy that this trivialization nourishes, the eminently ethical demands of biocentrism spins on a form of ecological circular reasoning. Biocentrists cannot assign human beings an imperative for ethical behavior that they do not assign to all other life forms, and simultaneously insist that humans are equal to other life forms in terms of inherent worth. Moreover, even if a biocentric society were to emerge, it would be obliged to intervene massively in first nature, with nearly all the sophisticated technologies it has at its disposal, to correct ecological dislocations on a scale that would leave the more purist deep ecologists utterly aghast. The very notion of so-called equality, as I have argued in chapter 6 in this book, even when applied to human beings alone, ignores individual differences in intelligence, talent, age, health, physical infirmity, and the like. Predicated as it is on a notion of justice, so-called equality compares poorly indeed with the notion of complementarity, predicated as it is on freedom.
a free society in which an ethics of complementarity prevails would make every attempt to compensate for the unavoidable inequalities and physical differences, degrees of intellectuality and needs among individual human beings. The notion of so-called equality is even more inappropriate when it is intended to encompass the non-human world as well. Differences among species vary far more widely than they do among individual humans. Any form of so-called equality, including those among humans, that fails to account for differences produced by the so-called natural inequities of age, physical capacities and subjective differences in a non-human world would be truly lacking in the empathy that underpins biocentric attitudes. Biocentrism, to put the matter bluntly, is as primitive and unsatisfactory ethically as anthropocentrism. Complementarity and wholeness, which social ecology substitutes for biocentricity, anthropocentricity, ecocentricity, and other centricities that plague us today, rest on the notion of otherness and the differentiations it presupposes. I have tried to present a fairly nuanced account of the interplay or dialectic between complementarity and conflict in organic society in the opening chapters of this book and in later chapters their interplay in ancient, medieval and capitalist societies as well as the very important issue of how hierarchy emerged. But the ecology of freedom is not only an account of the emergence of hierarchy, as its subtitle indicates, it is also an account of hierarchy's dissolution, not only as a process of realising an ecological society in the future, but in part at least as a history of the early uprisings and radical ideas of the dominated strata that sought to undo rule by the elites that oppressed them. In this history, there is a very special drama to which the reader's attention should be drawn. I refer to the wealth of historical alternatives that oppressed strata formulated and often even brought into being for a time to create free societies for themselves. We must not permit these alternatives to be discarded, far from belonging to the dustbin of history they should be seen as a treasure trove of discernible institutions, experiences and experiments, as well as imaginative ideas that never saw the light of day, a treasure that we must eagerly keep alive for the future. The irreducible minimum, the equality of unequals, and the ethics of complementarity that emerged in organic societies are imperishable standards for freedom, albeit standards that must be extended beyond parochial group, band and tribal bonds. The Greek notions of limit and balance in terms of needs and the Athenian institutions of direct democracy are also imperishable standards, albeit standards that must be divested of patricentricity, slavery, exclusionary forms of citizenship, and the high premium the Greeks placed on the arts of war. Christianity's vision of a universal humanitas for all the defects of the church must always be a guiding principle, albeit without any notion of a supernature to support it. The principle of confederation, so prominent in late medieval cities, as opposed to the nation-state, also belongs to the repertoire of freedom that we can cull from the past, albeit without the patriciates 
that ruled many cities in the late Middle Ages. It is not atavistic to cull from history the ways in which people developed humanistic lifeways and realistic institutions that could provide workable examples for developing a free society. To create a society based on differentiation, wholeness and complementarity, rather than any centricities, our ideas must be concrete and avoid the diffuseness that is so characteristic of the mystical tendencies in the ecology movement. I have examined in detail what an ecological and rational society might be in a number of my works, including the present one, and I have tried to offer a concrete, almost programmatic project for our times. I have called this project Libertarian Municipalism. It is libertarian a term created by 19th century European anarchists, not by contemporary American right-wing proprietarians, in that it advances a new politics of popular control over the material means of life, land, factories, transport, and the like. It is municipalist in that it advances a new politics of civic control over public affairs, mainly by means of direct face-to-face -face citizen assemblies. It is also confederalist in that it seeks to foster the interdependence of municipalities and their economies on a regional basis. Partly to avoid the parochialism of self-sufficient communities, which can easily become ingrown and self-aggrandizing, partly to deal with the need to coordinate the operations of these communities in a rational and ecological manner. Policy decisions are initiated, formulated and decided upon by the citizen assemblies of the municipalities, administrative decisions subject to careful oversight by the municipalities, are made by mandated, recallable delegates to confederal councils. Libertarian municipalism, potentially a very significant form of public life today, has a long historical pedigree in cities from the Middle Ages well into the 19th century. It was practiced with varying degrees of democracy to countervail emerging centralized nation states. Libertarian municipalism today seeks to recover and render viable the original Hellenic meaning of the term politics. The management of the affairs of the polis by means of a truly participatory democratic body of institutions. The prospect of making such a politics viable today is as plausible as it is necessary. Traditional socialist and anarcho-syndicalist policies of developing a class movement based on proletarian interests that presumably would emerge as a general interest against capitalism have failed beyond any hope of recovery. Capitalism has developed to a level where it has almost completely absorbed the class war envisioned by Marxists and syndicalists. If any general interest can emerge today, it is one that is shaped by external forces, notably the ecological limits of an economy that must, by its very nature, grow or die, thereby endangering the biosphere itself. And if any radical movement for social change and an ecological balance between first and second nature can be achieved, it must be based on a participatory democracy rooted in the politics of gradual confederalism, the step-by-step -step formation of civic networks that can ultimately challenge the growing power of the nation-state.
In the vocabulary of past radical movements, this new power would be a dual power, a power that, owing to its ability to form a trans-class general ecological interest, can face with growing confidence and moral authority the nation-state's monopoly of force. Here. The dangers of parochialism that might follow on the heels of decentralization can be reconciled by confederalism. A direct democracy, in turn, avoids the corruptive politics, so-called, produced by political professionalism, bureaucracy, and top-down representative systems of governance. Citizenship, expressed through popular assemblies. Can avoid a statist politics, so-called, based on the privatized anonymous constituent, so-called, who exercises no control over his or her social life. This is not the place to explore the traditions, practices, and prospects associated with libertarian municipalism. The institutions, economies. And interrelationships between civic and confederal bodies, and the new kind of citizen and politics that this system of self-governance involves, the most complete statement of these ideas can be found in my book, From Urbanization to Cities. Suffice it to say here that this political and economic solution to our current problems is also an ecological solution. The private ownership of the planet by elite strata must be brought to an end if we are to survive the afflictions it has imposed on the biotic world, particularly as a result of a society structured around limitless growth. Free nature, in my view, can only begin to emerge when we live in a fully participatory society. Literally free of privilege and domination. Only then will we be able to rid ourselves of the idea of dominating nature, and fulfil our promise for acting as a moral, rational, and creative force in natural as well as social evolution. Looking over the ecology of freedom today, I would emphasise. The lines I wrote on page eighty-four that celebrate humanity's capacity to alter the world in a way that combines a scientific discipline, ecology, with quote, the indiscipline of fancy, imagination, and artfulness. Unquote. The current emphasis by mystical ecologists on non-intervention or minimal intervention by humanity in first nature. The maxim, "Let nature take its course," is completely untenable. Rather, I would ask the reader to consult my quotation of Charles Elton. Quote, "The world's future has to be managed, but this management would not be like a game of chess, but more like steering a boat." Unquote. Today. I would emphasise that while the world cannot be dealt with like a game of chess, it nevertheless does, as Elton points out, have to be managed. If we do not intervene in the world today for purposes of ecological restoration, the management of wild areas and reforestation, neither we nor the wildlife we wish to conserve, is likely to have any future at all. We have gone beyond a so-called primeval world to a point where the possibility of returning to it is simply excluded, and in many respects we have developed new sensibilities, however marginal they may be today, that are even more advanced than those of our early ancestors. I would also emphasise my insistence on Hegel's famous maxim. The true is the whole, and my insistence on combining our changes of the natural world 
with the spontaneity of first nature. My concern with ecological stability as a function of unity in diversity and complexity, however, requires an explanation. The ecological consciousness of the 50s and early 60s, to the extent that there was one, was obliged to advocate ecological stability as a product of crop variety to avoid the use of dangerous pesticides, so heavily used in the kind of single crop monoculture that was and still is practiced by agribusiness. Only by playing insect and other animal populations against one another in variegated agricultural situations did it seem possible to reduce or eliminate the use of dangerous chemicals. Today, my emphasis on diversity and complexity rests on much broader grounds. A diversity of species, in my view, is vitally important because it opens up new pathways for the evolution of life. Eco-communities with more species are usually more complex. They tend to give rise to new, more subjective and more flexible life forms that in turn open greater evolutionary possibilities. I have discussed this phenomenon, which I call participatory evolution, in my 1986 essay, Freedom and Necessity in Nature. I am satisfied that Chapter 2, The Outlook of Organic Society, is substantially sound as it stands today. It is admittedly a polemical chapter, written to countervail the standard image of preliterate cultures as savage, so-called, by emphasising their benign aspects. I wanted to shatter this ugly image of preliterate peoples and explore more fully the ancestral sources of values like care, nurture, and early humanity's subjectivization or personalization of nature. But given the romantic mystification of preliterate societies so very much in vogue today, I should point out that preliterate cultures have or had no compunction about intervening significantly in the natural world. Indeed, many of their rituals and magical practices were spiritual means to facilitate their acts of intervention. I can only hope that this introduction helps to provide a more balanced account of the Wintu and Hopi Indians, the Ihalmayat Eskimos, and the other preliterate peoples to whom I refer in the book as active agents in changing first nature. I would also want to frame my discussion of complementarity in organic society in terms of this introduction's discussion of otherness. Preliterate people, as they emerge from an awareness of their particular ecological niches into that of a larger sense of first nature, were not oblivious to the fact that the world around them, the game that they hunted, and the plants that they cultivated, may have been highly personalised, but were also other than human. But this was not initially a view of the other as an opponent, much less one that had to be subjugated. It was based on a simple notion of the world as variegated, diversified, and basically ecological, as I have pointed out earlier. While we must carefully advance to a world view that has a complementary notion of otherness rather than a conflictual one, it must have secular and rational underpinnings. A quasi-animism, if you like, that is based on a respect and appreciation for the continuity of life rather than spirits or the myths of a supernature. The most potentially misleading passages in chapter 2 appear on pages 128 to 129, where I evoke the symbolism of a, quote, mother goddess as a fertility principle, so old in time that its stone remains have been found in Paleolithic caves and encampments, unquote. Let me emphasize 
that nowhere in this passage do I refer to, quote, her as an earth goddess, or as a pantheistic female presence in the world, nor do I identify so-called her with first nature. My characterization of this so-called mother goddess is the expression of, quote, the fecundity of nature in all its diversity, unquote. Still refers to a fertility principle, not an organized religion with its panoply of priestly corporations. The vegetation goddesses that emerged as part of full-blown religions with temples often managed by priests are not equivalent to earlier generalized fertility principles. These new female agricultural deities, in fact, were easily placed in the service of hierarchy, not organic egalitarian societies. Such goddesses and the priestly elites who gorged on the wealth they accumulated in goddess-oriented temples were no blessing for women, much less for oppressed people who toiled in so-called her behalf. At no point in my discussion did I suggest that we can return to Aboriginal lifeways. In fact, I was at pains to warn against any belief that we can or should do so. If we are to achieve an ecological society in the future, it will have to be enriched by the insights, knowledge and data we have acquired as a result of the long history of philosophy, science, technology and rationality, cleansed of magic, the worship of deities and primeval religions. Nor can we push our history aside. Rather, we must absorb what is ethically and intellectually valuable in it and discard what is ethically harmful. We should avoid superstition, incipient hierarchy, and a hierarchical sensibility of any kind. I would want to revise nothing in Chapter 3, The Emergence of Hierarchy. My treatment of the imminent, indeed dialectical, origins of status relations in early society has stood up beyond my greatest expectations, as recent data indicates. I would only note that all the evidence I could cull gives chronological priority to the emergence of gerontocracies over patriarchies, and that shamans usually play the sinister role in most tribal societies. Attempts by some ecofeminists to recycle my discussion of the development of hierarchy, to view patriarchy as the sole origin of domination, are spurious and self-serving. Indeed, as Janet Beale has shown so clearly in Finding Our Way, Rethinking Ecofeminist Politics, hierarchy assumed such a large variety of forms over time, including forms in which men dominate men, that to single out patriarchy as the exclusive and most abiding source of hierarchy verges on the nonsensical. I was at pains, moreover, to quote E. R. Dodds on page 191, to the effect that the patriarch had enormous power over the male members of the family, as well as the female. In patriarchal families, both women and men could be dealt with arbitrarily and cruelly, at times even by matriarchs like Sarah, who induced Abraham to drive his concubine Hagar and their son Ishmael into the desert. It should be noted that in quoting Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno's sentimental passage on page 193 of the book, to the effect that woman is the image of nature and a key stimulus to aggression, a passage that has found favour with more informed ecofeminists, I strongly qualify their remarks by a footnote that emphasises women's outstanding role in the early domestic economy 
around which preliterate society was structured, and its enormous importance in social development. My distinction between justice and freedom in chapter 6, justice, equal and exact, is as firmly rooted as ever these days. It is a discussion that acquires special significance in view of deep ecology's naive endeavour to attribute equality to all species in a biocentric democracy. Chapter 7, The Legacy of Freedom, continues to be as relevant as ever for our time. Gnosticism, as an emancipatory ideology, is less attractive to me now than it is to many mystics and ecofeminists who, once they learn that the Gnostic Sophia was a woman, are ready to embrace unthinkingly all the strictures of this highly dualistic, even sinister, religion. I am at pains to note, quote, Gnosticism must be dealt with prudently before any of its tendencies are described as Christian heresy. In its Manichean form, it is simply a different religion, like Islam or Buddhism. In its Ophite form, it is a total, utterly anarchistic inversion of Christian canon. Unquote. I hold no brook for Gnostic elitism, dualism, or in Maricon's form, its asceticism and amorality. The point I tried to make in my dialectical treatment of Gnosticism was to elicit its anarchistic and critical thrust, a problem that must be situated in the historical context and development of this religion, not by treating it as an ahistorical and consistent dogma that never underwent any changes in different times and places. There are no significant changes that I would make in the remaining chapters of the book, that I treated Hebrew transcendentalism unsatisfactorily by failing to emphasise that it sharply distinguished the eternality of nature from the mutability of society thereby opening society to the possibility of radical, even revolutionary changes for the first time in history, is a well-deserved criticism. I made this important point only in passing when I quoted H. and H. A. Frankfurt's observation that Hebrew transcendentalism led to a, quote, revolutionary and dynamic teaching, unquote, by postulating, quote, a metaphysical significance for social history and for man's actions. Unquote. It thereby freed human thought and practice from the unchangeable, indeed necessitarian world of nature, its domain of eternal recurrence and its paralyzing deities. Again, Janet Beale has provided an invaluable corrective for this omission. Chapter 11 the ambiguities of freedom, which I regard as the most important in the book, is singularly appropriate today. Its argument for an ecologically oriented rationality, science and techniques could stand rereading by any thoughtful individual. Only one caveat should be noted. My criticisms of Horkheimer and Adorno are too gentle Despite their word magic, I do not feel that their ideas have the applicability to our times that so many Frankfurt School admirers would have us believe. The dialectic of enlightenment is a very enchanting work, but it fares poorly as a defence of reason, nor does it have a clear sense of direction in its treatment of reason. In retrospect, I do not find it accidental that it has been picked up by many postmodernists, together with Adorno's wayward writings, as a precursor of the high culture nihilism that is very much in vogue today. Chapter 12 deals, of course, with an ecological society, and the epilogue advances the fundamentals of a nature philosophy and a naturalistic ethics. Lest this portion of the book be misunderstood, 
I point out that we cannot return to an idyllic Garden of Eden, and that reason, quote, must be permitted to stake out its own claim to a libertarian rationality, unquote. But the reader should be aware that I permitted myself to use many words for strictly evocative purposes, in the hope that I could combine theoretical insights with metaphors that were meant to reach the reader's emotions. My almost animistic remark that, quote, nature is writing its own natural philosophy and ethics, unquote, is to be understood as a string of metaphors. Nature really does what it does best, develop, diversify, and produce increasingly complex phenomena. Despite my quotations from Lynn Margulis's discussion of the active role that life plays in creating its environment, I nowhere accept, and today I firmly reject, her commitment to a variant of the Gaia hypothesis, which sees the planet as a single organism. In closing, let me restate my plea that the reader examine the original introduction that follows. Despite the fact that it overlaps with the present introduction, within a span of a few pages, it provides the essential outlines of social ecology. The ecology movement will never gain any real influence or have any significant impact on society if it advances a message of despair rather than hope, of a regressive and impossible return to primordial human cultures and sensibilities, rather than a commitment to human progress and to a uniquely human empathy for life as a whole. I can easily understand why despair exists among many mystical ecologists, indeed in the environmental movement generally, over the impact of a grow-or-die capitalistic economy on the biosphere and on the human psyche. While a patronising, quasi-religious, often misanthropic ecology that denigrates the uniqueness of human beings and the wondrous role they can play in natural evolution may be an understandable response to that economy. It is a denial of humanity's most human potentiality, the ability to change the world for the better and enrich it for virtually all life forms. We must recover the utopian impulses, the hopefulness, the appreciation of what is good, what is worth rescuing in human civilization, as well as what must be rejected if the ecology movement is to play a transformative and creative role in human affairs. For without changing society, we will not change the disastrous ecological direction in which capitalism is moving. Spiritualistic movements have been at work in human history for thousands of years. They have doubtless changed the thinking and behaviour of many people. But rarely, as the history of all the great world religions attests, have they created an ecologically humanistic society. This kind of society will never be achieved without ideas that confront the material as well as spiritual conditions of life, indeed of public life as well as private life. May the 20th, 1991Introduction. This book was written to satisfy the need for a consistently radical social ecology, an ecology of freedom. It had been maturing in my mind since 1952, when I first became acutely conscious of the growing environmental crisis that was to assume such monumental proportions a generation later. In that year, I published a volume-sized article, The Problems of Chemicals in Food, later to be republished in book form in Germany as 
Lebenskafalik Liebenschmittel. Owing to my early Marxian intellectual training, the article examines not merely environmental pollution, but also its deep-seated social origins. Environmental issues had developed in my mind as social issues, and problems of natural ecology had become problems of social ecology, an expression hardly in use at the time. The subject was never to leave me. In fact, its dimensions were to widen and deepen immensely. By the early 60s, my views could be summarized in a fairly crisp formulation. The very notion of the domination of nature by man stems from the very real domination of human by human. For me, this was a far-reaching reversal of concepts. The many articles and books I published in the years after 1952, beginning with Our Synthetic Environment and continuing with Toward an Ecological Society, were largely explorations of this fundamental theme. As one premise led to another, it became clear that a highly coherent project was forming in my work. The need to explain the emergence of social hierarchy and domination, and to elucidate the means, sensibility, and practice that could yield a truly harmonious ecological society. My book, Post-Scarcity Anarchism, pioneered this vision. Composed of essays dating from 1964, it addressed itself more to hierarchy than class, to domination rather than exploitation, to liberatory institutions rather than the mere abolition of the state, to freedom rather than justice, and pleasure rather than happiness. For me, these changing emphases were not mere countercultural rhetoric. They marked a sweeping departure from my earlier commitment to socialist orthodoxies of all forms. I visualized instead a new form of libertarian social ecology, or what Victor Furkis, in discussing my social views, so appropriately called eco-anarchism. As recently as the 60s, words like hierarchy and domination were rarely used. Traditional radicals, particularly Marxists, still spoke almost exclusively in terms of class, class analyses, and class consciousness. Their concepts of oppression were primarily confined to material exploitation, grinding poverty, and the unjust abuse of labour. Likewise, orthodox anarchists placed most of their emphasis on the state as the ubiquitous source of social coercion. Just as the emergence of private property became society's original sin in Marxian orthodoxy, so the emergence of the state became society's original sin in anarchist orthodoxy. Even the early counterculture of the 60s eschewed the use of the term hierarchy and preferred to question authority without exploring the genesis of authority, its relationship to nature, and its meaning for the creation of a new society. During these years, I also concentrated on how a truly free society, based on ecological principles, could mediate humanity's relationship with nature. As a result, I began to explore the development of a new technology, scaled to comprehensible human dimensions. Such a technology would include small solar and wind installations, organic gardens, and the use of local, natural resources worked by decentralized communities. This view quickly gave rise to another, the need for direct democracy, for urban decentralization 
for a high measure of self-sufficiency, for self-empowerment based on communal forms of social life. In short, the non-authoritarian commune composed of communes. As I publish these ideas over the years, especially in the decade between the early 60s and early 70s, what began to trouble me was the extent to which people tended to subvert their unity, coherence and radical focus. Notions like decentralization and human scale, for example, were deftly adopted without reference to solar and wind techniques or bioagricultural practices that are their material underpinnings. Each segment was permitted to plummet off on its own, while the philosophy that unified them into an integrated whole was permitted to languish. Decentralization entered city planning as a mere stratagem for community design, while alternative technology became a narrow discipline, increasingly confined to the academy and to a new breed of technocrats. In turn, each notion became divorced from a critical analysis of society, from a radical theory of social ecology. It has become clear to me that it was the unity of my views, their ecological holism, not merely their individual components, that gave them a radical thrust. That a society is decentralized, that it uses solar or wind energy, that it is farmed organically, or that it reduces pollution. None of these measures by itself, or even in limited combination with others, makes an ecological society. Nor do piecemeal steps, however well intended, even partially resolve problems that have reached a universal, global, and catastrophic character. If anything, partial solutions, so-called, serve merely as cosmetics to conceal the deep-seated nature of the ecological crisis. They thereby deflect public attention and theoretical insight from an adequate understanding of the depth and scope of the necessary changes. Combined in a coherent whole, and supported by a consistently radical practice, however, these views challenge the status quo in a far-reaching manner, in the only manner commensurate with the nature of the crisis. It was precisely this synthesis of ideas that I sought to achieve in The Ecology of Freedom, and this synthesis had to be rooted in history, in the development of social relations, social institutions, changing technologies and sensibilities, and political structures. Only in this way could I hope to establish a sense of genesis, contrast, and continuity that would give real meaning to my views. The reconstructive utopian thinking that followed from my synthesis could then be based on the realities of human experience. What should be could become what must be. If humanity and the biological complexity on which it rests were to survive, change and reconstruction could emerge from existing problems rather than wishful thinking and misty vagaries. My use of the word hierarchy in the subtitle of this work is meant to be provocative. There is a strong theoretical need to contrast hierarchy with the more widespread use of the words class and state. Careless use of these terms can produce a dangerous simplification of social reality. To use the words hierarchy, class and state interchangeably, as many social theorists do, is insidious and obscurantist.
This practice, in the name of a classless or libertarian society, could easily conceal the existence of hierarchical relationships and a hierarchical sensibility, both of which, even in the absence of economic exploitation or political coercion, would serve to perpetuate unfreedom. By hierarchy, I mean the cultural, traditional and psychological systems of obedience and command, not merely the economic and political systems to which the terms class and state most appropriately refer. Accordingly, hierarchy and domination could easily continue to exist in a classless or stateless society. I refer to the domination of the young by the old, of women by men, of one ethnic group by another, of masses by bureaucrats who profess to speak in their so-called higher social interests, of countryside by town, and in a more subtle psychological sense, of body by mind, of spirit by a shallow instrumental rationality, and of nature by society and technology. Indeed, classless but hierarchical societies exist today, and they existed more covertly in the past. Yet the people who live in them neither enjoy freedom nor do they exercise control over their lives. Marx, whose works largely account for this conceptual obfuscation, offered us a fairly explicit definition of class. He had the advantage of developing his theory of class society within a sternly objective economic framework. His widespread acceptance may well reflect the extent to which our own era gives supremacy to economic issues over all other aspects of social life. There is, in fact, a certain elegance and grandeur to the notion that the Quote, history of all hitherto existing society has been the history of class struggles. Unquote. Put quite simply, a ruling class is a privileged social stratum that owns or controls the means of production and exploits a larger mass of people, the ruled class, which works these productive forces. Class relationships are essentially relationships of production based on ownership of land, tools, machines and the produce thereof. Exploitation, in turn, is the use of the labour of others to provide for one's own material needs, for luxuries and leisure, and for the accumulation and productive renewal of technology. There the matter of class definition could be said to rest, and with it Marx's famous method of class analysis as the authentic unravelling of the material basis of economic interests, ideologies and culture. Hierarchy, although it includes Marx's definition of class and even gives rise to class society historically, goes beyond this limited meaning imputed to a largely economic form of stratification. To say this, however, does not define the meaning of the term hierarchy, and I doubt that the word can be encompassed by a formal definition. I view it historically and existentially as a complex system of command and obedience in which elites enjoy varying degrees of control over their subordinates without necessarily exploiting them. Such elites may completely lack any form of material wealth. They may even be dispossessed of it, much as Plato's guardian elite was socially powerful but materially poor. Hierarchy is not merely a social condition, it is also a state of consciousness 
a sensibility toward phenomena at every level of personal and social experience. Early preliterate societies, organic societies as I call them, existed in a fairly integrated and unified form based on kinship ties, age groups, and the sexual division of labour. Their high sense of internal unity and their egalitarian outlook extended not only to each other, but to their relationship with nature. People in preliterate cultures viewed themselves not as the lords of creation, to borrow a phrase used by Christian millenarians, but as part of the natural world. They were neither above nature nor below it, but within it. In organic societies, the differences between individuals, age groups, sexes, and between humanity and the natural manifold of living and non-living phenomena were seen, to use Hegel's superb phrase, as a unity of differences, or unity of diversity, not as hierarchies. Their outlook was distinctly ecological, and from this outlook, they almost unconsciously derived a body of values that influenced their behaviour toward individuals in their own communities and the world of life. As I contend in the following pages, ecology knows no king of beasts and no lowly creatures. Such terms come from our own hierarchical mentality. Rather, it deals with ecosystems in which living things are interdependent and play complementary roles in perpetuating the stability of the natural order. Gradually, organic societies began to develop less traditional forms of differentiation and stratification. Their primal unity began to break down. The socio-political or civil sphere of life expanded, giving increasing eminence to the elders and males of the community, who now claimed this sphere as part of the division of tribal labour. Male supremacy over women and children emerged primarily as a result of the male's social functions in the community, functions that were not by any means exclusively economic as Marxian theorists would have us believe. Male cunning in the manipulation of women was to appear later. Until this phase of history or prehistory, the elders and males rarely exercised socially dominant roles because their civil sphere was simply not very important to the community. Indeed, the civil sphere was markedly counterbalanced by the enormous significance of the woman's so-called domestic sphere. Household and childbearing responsibilities were much more important in early organic societies than politics and military affairs. Early society was profoundly different from contemporary society in its structural arrangements and the roles played by different members of the community. Yet even with the emergence of hierarchy, there were still no economic classes or state structures, nor were people materially exploited in a systematic manner. Certain strata, such as the elders and shamans, and ultimately the males in general, began to claim privileges for themselves. Often merely as a matter of prestige, based on social recognition rather than material gain. The nature of these privileges, if such they can be called, requires a more sophisticated discussion than it has received to date, and I have tried to examine them carefully in considerable detail. Only later did economic classes and economic exploitation begin to appear, eventually to be followed by the state with its far-reaching bureaucratic and military paraphernalia. But 
The dissolution of organic societies into hierarchical, class and political societies occurred unevenly and erratically, shifting back and forth over long periods of time. We can see this most strikingly in the relationships between men and women, particularly in terms of the values that have been associated with changing social roles. For example, although anthropologists have long assigned an inordinate degree of social eminence to men in highly developed hunting cultures, an eminence they probably never enjoyed in the more primal foraging bands of their ancestors, the supersession of hunting by horticulture, in which gardening was performed mainly by women, probably redressed whatever earlier imbalances may have existed between the sexes. The so-called aggressive male hunter and the so-called passive female food gatherer are the theatrically exaggerated images that male anthropologists of a past era inflicted on their so-called savage Aboriginal subjects. But certainly tensions and vicissitudes in values, quite aside from social relationships, must have simmered within primordial hunting and gathering communities. To deny the very existence of the latent attitudinal tensions that must have existed between the male hunter, who had to kill for his food and later make war on his fellow beings, and the female food gatherer who foraged for her food and later cultivated it, would make it very difficult to explain why patriarchy and its harshly aggressive outlook ever emerged at all. Although the changes I have adduced were technologically and partially economic, as terms like food gatherers, hunters, and horticulturalists seem to imply, we should not assume that these changes were directly responsible for shifts in sexual status. Given the level of hierarchical difference that emerged in this early period of social life, even in a patricentric community, women were still not abject inferiors of men, nor were the young placed in grim subjugation to the old. Indeed, the appearance of a ranking system that conferred privilege on one stratum over another, notably the old over the young, was on its way from a form of compensation that more often reflected the egalitarian features of organic society rather than the authoritarian features of later societies. When the number of horticultural communities began to multiply to a point where cultivable land became relatively scarce and warfare increasingly common, the younger warriors began to enjoy a socio-political eminence that made them the so-called big men of the community, sharing civil power with the elders and shamans. Throughout, matricentric customs, religions and sensibilities coexisted with patricentric ones, so that the sterner features of patriarchy were often absent during this transitional period. Whether matricentric or patricentric, the older egalitarianism of organic society permeated social life and faded away only slowly, leaving many vestigial remains long after class society had fastened its hold on popular values and sensibilities. The state, economic classes and the systematic exploitation of subjugated peoples followed from a more complex and protracted development than radical theorists recognised in their day. Their visions of the origins of class and political societies were instead the culmination of an earlier, richly articulated development of society into hierarchical forms. The divisions within organic society increasingly raised the old to supremacy over the young, 
men to supremacy over women, the shaman and later the priestly corporation to supremacy over lay society, one class to supremacy over another, and state formations to supremacy over society in general. For the reader imbued with the conventional wisdom of our era, I cannot emphasize too strongly that society in the form of bands, families, clans, tribes, tribal federations, villages, and even municipalities, long antedates state formations. The state, with its specialized functionaries, bureaucracies, and armies, emerges quite late in human social development. Often well beyond the threshold of history, it remained in sharp conflict with coexisting social structures such as guilds, neighborhoods, popular societies, cooperatives, town meetings, and a wide variety of municipal assemblies. But the hierarchical organization of all differentia did not end with the structuring of civil society into an institutionalized system of obedience and command. In time, hierarchy began to invade less tangible fields of life. Mental activity was given supremacy over physical work, intellectual experience over sensuousness, the reality principle, so-called, over the pleasure principle, so-called. And finally, judgment, morality and spirit were pervaded by an ineffable authoritarianism that was to take its vengeful command over language and the most rudimentary forms of symbolization. The vision of social and natural diversity was altered from an organic sensibility that sees different phenomena as unity in diversity into a hierarchical mentality that ranked the most minuscule phenomena into mutually antagonistic pyramids erected around notions of inferior and superior. And what happens as a sensibility has evolved into concrete social fact? Thus, the effort to restore the ecological principle of unity in diversity has become a social effort in its own right. A revolutionary effort that must rearrange sensibility in order to rearrange the real world. A hierarchical mentality fosters the renunciation of the pleasures of life. It justifies toil, guilt and sacrifice by the inferiors and pleasure and the indulgent gratification of virtually every caprice by their superiors. The objective history of the social structure becomes internalized as a subjective history of the psychic structure. Heinous as my view may be to modern Freudians, it is not the discipline of work, but the discipline of rule that demands the repression of internal nature. This repression then extends outward to external nature as a mere object of rule and later of exploitation. This mentality permeates our individual psyches in a cumulative form up to the present day, not merely as capitalism, but as the vast history of hierarchical society from its inception. Unless we explore this history, which lives actively within us as earlier phases of our individual lives, we will never be free of its hold. We may eliminate social injustice, but we will not achieve social freedom. We may eliminate classes and exploitation, but we will not be spared from the trammels of hierarchy and domination. We may exercise the spirit of gain and accumulation from our psyches, but we will still be burdened by gnawing guilt, renunciation and the subtle belief in the vices of sensuousness.
Another series of distinctions appears in this book. The distinction between morality and ethics, and between justice and freedom. Morality, as I use this term, denotes conscious standards of behaviour that have not yet been subjected to thorough rational analyses by a community. I have eschewed the use of the word custom as a substitute for the word morality, because moral criteria for judging behaviour do involve some kind of explanation and cannot be reduced to the conditioned social reflexes we usually call custom. The Mosaic commandments, like those of other world religions, for example, were justified on theological grounds. They were the sacrosanct words of Yahweh, which we might reasonably challenge today because they are not grounded in reason. Ethics, by contrast, invites rational analyses and, like Kant's moral imperative, must be justified by intellectual operations, not mere faith. Hence, morality lies somewhere between unthinking custom and rational ethical criteria of right and wrong. Without making these distinctions, it would be difficult to explain the increasingly ethical claims the state has made on its citizens, particularly in eroding the archaic moral codes that supported the patriarch's complete control over his family and the impediments this authority has placed in the way of politically more expansive societies like the Athenian polis. The distinction between justice and freedom, between formal equality and substantive equality, is even more basic and continually recurs throughout the book. This distinction has rarely been explored even by radical theorists, who often still echo the historical cry of the oppressed for justice rather than freedom. Worse yet, the two have been used as equivalents, which they decidedly are not. The young Prodon, and later Marx, correctly perceived that true freedom presupposes an equality based on a recognition of inequality the inequality of capacities and needs, of abilities and responsibilities. Mere formal equality, which, so-called justly, rewards each according to his or her contribution to society, and sees everyone as equal in the eyes of the law and equal in opportunity, grossly obscures the fact that the young and old, the weak and infirm, the individual with few responsibilities and the one with many, not to speak of the rich and the poor in contemporary society, by no means enjoys genuine equality in a society guided by the rule of equivalence. Indeed, terms like rewards, needs, opportunity, or for that matter, property, however communally owned, so-called, or collectively operated, require as much investigation as the word law. Unfortunately, the revolutionary tradition did not fully develop these themes and their embodiment in certain terms. Socialism, in most of its forms, gradually degenerated into a demand for economic justice, so-called, thereby merely restating the rule of equivalence as an economic emendation to the juridical and political rule of equivalence established by the bourgeoisie. It is my purpose to thoroughly unscramble these distinctions to demonstrate how the confusion arose in the first place and how it can be clarified so it no longer burdens the future. A third contrast that I try to develop in this book is the distinction between happiness and pleasure. Happiness, as defined here, is the mere satisfaction of need 
of our survival needs for food, shelter, clothing, and material security. In short, our needs as animal organisms. Pleasure, by contrast, is the satisfaction of our desires, of our intellectual, aesthetic, sensuous, and playful daydreams. The social quest for happiness, which so often seems liberating, tends to occur in ways that shrewdly devalue or repress the quest for pleasure. We can see evidence of this regressive development in many radical ideologies that justify toil and need at the expense of artful work and sensuous joy. That these ideologies denounce the quest for fulfilment of the sensuous as bourgeois individualism and libertinism hardly requires mention. Yet it is precisely in this utopistic quest for pleasure, I believe, that humanity begins to gain its most sparkling glimpse of emancipation. With this quest carried to the social realm, rather than confined to a privatized hedonism, humanity begins to transcend the realm of justice, even of a classless society, and enters into the realm of freedom, a realm conceived as the full realization of humanity's potentialities in their most creative form. If I were asked to single out the one underlying contrast that permeates this book, it is the seeming conflict between the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom. Conceptually, this conflict dates back to Aristotle's politics. It involves the blind world of natural or external nature and the rational world of human or internal nature that society must dominate to create the material conditions for freedom. The free time and leisure to allow man to develop his potentials and powers. This drama is redolent with the conflict between nature and society, woman and man, and body and reason that permeates Western images of civilization. It has underpinned almost every rationalistic account of history. It has been used ideologically to justify domination in virtually every aspect of life. Its apotheosis, ironically, is reached in various socialisms, particularly those of Robert, Owen, Saint-Simon, and its most sophisticated form, Karl Marx. Marx's image of the savage who wrestles with nature is not an expression so much of enlightenment hubris as it is of Victorian arrogance. Woman, as Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer observed, has no stake in this conflict. It is strictly between man and nature. From Aristotle's time to Marx's, the split is regarded as inevitable. The gap between necessity and freedom may be narrowed by technological advances that give man an ever greater ascendancy over nature. But it can never be bridged. What puzzled a few highly sophisticated Marxists in later years was how the repression and disciplining of external nature could be achieved without repressing and disciplining internal nature. How could natural nature be kept in tow without subjugating human nature? My attempt to unravel this puzzle involves an effort to deal with the Victorian's mythic savage, so-called. To investigate external nature and its relationship to internal nature. To give meaning to the world of necessity, nature, in terms of the ability of the world of freedom, society, to colonize and liberate it. My strategy is to re-examine the evolution and meaning of technology in a new ecological light. I will try to ascertain how work ceased to be attractive and playful and turned 
into onerous toil. Hence, I am led to a drastic reconsideration of the nature and structure of techniques, of work, and of humanity's metabolism with nature. Here, I would like to emphasize that my views on nature are linked by a fairly unorthodox notion of reason. As Adorno and Horkheimer have emphasized, reason was once perceived as an imminent feature of reality, indeed, as the organizing and motivating principle of the world. It was seen as an inherent force, as the Logos, that imparted meaning and coherence to reality at all levels of existence. The modern world has abandoned this notion and reduced reason to rationalization, that is, to a mere technique for achieving practical ends. Logos, in effect, was simply turned into logic. This book tries to recover this notion of an imminent world reason, albeit without the archaic, quasi-theological trappings that render this notion untenable to a more knowledgeable and secular society. In my view, reason exists in nature as the self-organizing attributes of substance. It is the latent subjectivity in the inorganic and organic levels of reality that reveal an inherent striving toward consciousness. In humanity, this subjectivity reveals itself as self-consciousness. I do not claim that my approach is unique. An extensive literature that supports the existence of a seemingly intrinsic logos in nature derives mainly from the scientific community itself. What I have tried to do here is to cast my speculations about reason in distinctly historical and ecological terms, free of the theological and mystical proclivities that have so often marred the formulations of a rational nature philosophy. In the closing chapters, I try to explore the interface between nature philosophy and libertarian social theory. I am also obliged to recover the authentic utopian tradition, particularly as expressed by Rabelais, Charles Fourier and William Morris, from amidst the debris of futurism that conceals it. Futurism, as exemplified by the works of Hermann Kahn, merely extrapolates the hideous present into an even more hideous future and thereby effaces the creative, imaginative dimensions of futurity. By contrast, the utopian tradition seeks to permeate necessity with freedom, work with play, even toil with artfulness and festiveness. My contrast between utopianism and futurism forms the basis for a creative, liberatory construction of an ecological society for a sense of human mission and meaning as nature rendered self-conscious. This book opens with a Norse myth that depicts how the gods must pay a penalty for seeking the conquest of nature. It ends with a social project for removing that penalty, whose Latin root poenalis has given us the word pain. Humanity will become the deities it created in its imagination, albeit as deities within nature, not above nature, as supernatural entities. The title of this book, The Ecology of Freedom, is meant to express the reconciliation of nature and human society in a new ecological sensibility and a new ecological society. A reharmonization of nature and humanity through a reharmonization of human with human.